hypnotic dance She holds me here with only a glance She's over me She's over me everybody and welcome to the paranormal portal our wednesday edition two hours of paranormal fun just waiting for you guys just all set up and set up in this beautiful paranormal buffet but uh before i go further i should introduce my good friend and co-host mr don longbeard and i should unmute you before you try talking oh thank you yeah maybe you should take me back off because i can't do anything but bite my fingernails oh <laughs> Are you a little bit nervous? Yeah. Oh man. Well, think about who we got on. I know it's tough. It's yeah. tough to to support the weight, but know, uh, yeah. it's a big show for us here Atlas, tonight on the. Hold me up. <laughs> it's a big show for us here tonight on the Paranormal Welcome Portal. We uh, big show. we brought in a special guest, and it's his first appearance here on the portal, and we're absolutely honored to have him, ladies and gentlemen. And I'm sure he's a name that really doesn't need any introduction, but I'm going to introduce him all the same, <laughs> because otherwise I would just be uh, remiss in my duties as the MC and host of the portal. So uh, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Vic Hundiff to the show of Dogman Encounters Radio and Bigfoot Eyewitness Radio. He is with us today to enlighten us on the ways of the dog man. Welcome, sir. How you doing? I'm doing great. And you? Oh, we're doing great. And thank you so much for making this work and coming on the show. It's an absolute pleasure to have you here. Well, it's great being on. You know, <laughs> kind of let down, guys. You kind of built this guest up and everything. You said you had this great guest <laughs> lined up for tonight's show. And I'm thinking, wow, who do they have lined up for the show? And then you said it was me. And I thought, okay. Oh, the man's wow. a comedian as well. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, we've got a great show with a great guest that couldn't make it. So instead, we're bringing you Vic on Def. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show. <laughs> No, it's good to have you, man. I've been a listener of Dogman Encounters for a long time, and I, you know, I've got to say that you you have been like at the spearhead, the tip of the spear, on bringing the Dogman into the under our you know social consciousness, so to speak. Um, what you're doing and, and what you've done is is really, I think, firmly established it in you know in the minds of all of us paranormal encrypted enthusiasts. But uh, how how did this all start for you? Well, back in 2007 and 2008, I was a co-host on a podcast called Campfire Shadows with the now deceased, unfortunately, Shane McMahon. Oh. And when I was co-hosting that show with Shane, there were regulars, Bear, everyone knows Bear, oh, sure. Bear and Kumbo and, mm -hmm. and Dan Ricky and Vicky. Well, they would come on the show and they would talk about their latest adventure out into maybe the LBL or some other place where they were out boogering. Well, at one point, Bear came back and was talking about this outing that they went on where they ran into this dog-faced booger. That's what he called it. Oh. And when I heard that term, that appellation, dog-faced booger, I thought, okay, well, they were just talking about some kind of funny-looking Sasquatch. Uh -huh. Well, as I dug more and more into it, and I found out that, no, this wasn't a Sasquatch he was talking about. It was something that looked kind of like a werewolf uh -huh. or a lot like a werewolf. I thought, whoa, I've got to look more into this. and. As I dug more and more into the dogman phenomenon, I found out that they were actually called dogmen. And there came a point where I realized, okay, if you have a Sasquatch encounter, you can practically go to your corner store and find someone to get help if you need help. 
talking to someone about your experience or experiences. Mm -hmm. Well, I thought if you have a dogman encounter, where do you go? Who do you talk to to try and get help so that you can deal with it in a healthy way? And I thought, well, you know, there really is no one out there that you could do that with. Mm -hmm. So I thought, you know what, there's a a niche that needs to be filled here. Well, of course, it wasn't until years later where I put all the pieces together for dogman encounters, but that was the genesis of it. That's really that's really cool and and yeah I mean you know for me I don't think dogman entered my entered my vocabulary for uh, you know maybe it was about 10 years ago at the at the earliest that I finally heard some kind of mention of it but this this phenomenon just kind of it well it seems it seems as if it just suddenly appeared um but you know once I started looking into it uh, I think isn't the earliest uh, encounter from some lumberjacks in Michigan in the 1800s? Is that right? Yeah, 1887 in Wexford County, Michigan. That's the first documented dogman encounter. Wow. Now, is there is there a tradition in the First Nations as well for these? And I, I, this is a this just kind of occurred yeah. to me now, but I, I I don't remember ever hearing too much about it uh, as far as far as a reference like that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they have legends. There are plenty of legends amongst Native Americans about dog men. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah, almost as many, it seems like, as with Sasquatch and some of the Native American groups. But, yeah, it's easy to think that because almost all you hear about with regards to cryptids would be Sasquatch, that there really isn't much on the dog man side. But there's a lot more to it than what most people know. So, and yeah, they've been here for a long time. I'm sure they predate us when it comes down to it. Wow. Oh, sure. So that you think that they've been, they've been a part of this, of this area, at least, uh, since about the same amount of time as a Bigfoot, would you suppose? Oh, I'll bet they have. I'm sure they have. Okay. Now I got to ask you some, some questions about, about the history of, of the dog man, because this is, this is something that comes up. Uh, you know, a lot of people you know, think that dog man is a new phenomenon, brand new. It's just been kind of invented. And, and that certainly doesn't seem to be the case, but there's these ancient references to like the sinocephaly. Mm-hmm. And do you think that these are the same thing as the sinocephaly that are reported from the, the ancient world? No, definitely not. Okay. The sinocephali, they walked in a plantigrade manner. They have hominid-style legs, in other words, the way we have, or a Sasquatch would have. Well, with most dogman encounters, the dogman people report seeing, they walked in a digitigrade fashion, just up on their toes, the way a dog would, or a horse would, or a cat would. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, that makes up the bulk of the encounters that come in. I'd say a good solid 90% of the encounters or more, they are canine-style dogman encounters like that with the digitigrade leg structure. So, yeah, sinocephali, they're always depicted as having hominid-style legs, basically the body of a man with the head of a wolf-like – I lose that – I use that term loosely – but a wolf-like head on that man-like body. So, no, it's apples and oranges. Hmm. Now, are, are the sinocephali still reported to this day, or is that just something that seems to have died out completely? Well, that's a mixed bag right there. Some people, they think that type 3 dogmen are sinocephali, but who knows? I mean, all we can do is guess about that. Okay, now, I, I, you, you just wow, introduced something yeah, brand new to me, did. <laughs> and that's the, the, the type system. Can you, can you give us a breakdown of what does that mean? I, I've not heard that before. Are you guys comfy? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> If you're not, you better get comfy. (laughs) (laughs) Well, there's a lot of friction in the dogman world when it comes to what are commonly called type 3 dogmen. Some people say type 3 Sasquatch, but that's not accurate. Type 3, whether you want to call them type 3 dogmen or incorrectly type 3 Sasquatch, they basically are cryptids with a body that has hominid-style legs. Mm -hmm. They have claws on the tips of their fingers, claws on the tips of their toes. They can have heads that look pretty baboonish in structure and appearance. They can also have other kinds of heads. There are type threes that have heads that look very 
reminiscent of the werewolf from an American werewolf in London. Mm -hmm. There are several variations to type threes, but yeah, type threes are any type of cryptid that, that has claws and has sharp teeth, a muzzle and is hair covered basically that has hominid style legs that basically the term type three encompasses that whole group of, of cryptids. Oh, so okay. that's about the best way I can describe that. And when it comes to dogmen, there are basically two classifications I use. You have the okay. canine type over here, which that, again, that makes up probably 90, maybe 95% of the encounters that come into me. And then over here, you've got type threes. So basically, you have the two different groups and everything. Oh, okay. Okay. And, and of course, the, the, the stories seem to kind of spearhead out of Michigan and at least in our, our modern references of it, but are, are they, is their range perhaps as big as, as w what a Sasquatch's range is as for not, not personally, but I mean, just as is the species is spread out as a Sasquatch, uh, you know, with the, the, the skunk ape, the grass man, the, you know, the wood boogers, the, you know, the, the different regional. Right. Yeah. yeah. Are the dogmen uh, as prolifically placed as that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. they are. I don't know of any encounters that have been reported in Nepal the way you have Yeti encounters, but uh -huh. yeah, they're all over the world. Australia, Serbia. I've had them come in from all over, wow. all over the United States. A lot of people think, okay, yeah, the Michigan Dog Man or the Beast from the Beast of Bray Road in right. Wisconsin. Right. Okay, so that must be where you can find Dog Man. No, you can find them in any state in the United States. In the 48 continuous, where it's funny, speaking of that, that reminds me, there was a guy who contacted me about five years ago from Rhode Island, oh. and he had just gotten into the whole dogma phenomenon, and he was thumbing his nose at me, talking about how, well, thank goodness I don't have to worry about dogmen here in Rhode <laughs> Island. Well, I guess he caught me on a, on a, when I was in a, an ornery mood or something like that. So I decided to forward a link to a story about this dog man that actually was seen so often in the Rhode Island area that it had a nickname, oh. but yeah, I mean, they're seen all over, and, all and, over. And there uh, are people in Australia that don't believe they're down there, yeah, yeah, but <laughs> the indigenous people of Australia, they have legends about them. Not all the indigenous people in Australia have legends about them, but there have been indigenous people from Australia who have contacted me to tell me, oh yeah, the people who don't think that we have legends about them, well, my tribe does. So mm. yeah, they're all over there. I've, we've had probably three, four eyewitnesses on the show where they came on and talked about their dogman encounters down there in Australia. So Africa, yeah, they're all over. Not in Idaho. There's none in Idaho. I know there's none Actually, in Idaho. Actually, right behind Vic. your house. <laughs> <laughs> right, <yeah. laughs> you know, actually, we, we, we have a friend named Cindy Goodbreak. She used to kind of run around with a, a bear in them uh, down in Texas, but she's, she's living up here now. And she was outside one night like a year, year and a half ago, I think it was, and she thought that she had heard something that sounded more like a dog man than a than a than a sasquatch. And of course, she's a sasquatch um, Re uh, researcher. researcher yeah. You know, so you know, I kind of give credence to that. But she she only lives fifty miles away, and I don't want to hear about that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sure you don't, but. I want you to understand something. If you have a forest near you that's big enough to house a, at least a fairly respectable population of deer, mm -hmm. well, that that greatly increases the chance that at some time you have a dogman in that forest. Uh. If that forest also has coyotes in it, mm -hmm. then that just catapults the the odds of you having at least at some point of the year that forest having a dog man or dog men plural in it. These things are so much more common than what you would ever imagine. Wow. It's just that if you have a Sasquatch encounter, okay, the person's very unlikely to come forward and report it. If you have a dog man encounter, if you actually see something that looks like a werewolf, then you're probably 20 times less likely than that Sasquatch mm -hmm. eyewitness uh -huh. to come forward and talk about it. So I bet you good money you know people who have had dog man encounters of their own but they never came forward to talk about it. So you don't know that they had them. 
So is this interview over, Brent? Because now I need to go home and change. <laughs> we, uh, yeah, that's we... what spray and wash is for. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Uh, yeah, we live we live up here in North Idaho, where there's mountains and forests and deer and bear and elk. I, yeah, elk and moose and Caribou. I have coyotes all over my place out there. And now I don't feel safe anymore. <laughs> <laughs> if you have a healthy ecosystem like that, then yeah, I'd bet you good money that you have uh, more dogmen around than you'd ever be comfortable knowing about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one That's is a great too way many. To classify. A half of one is too many. Wow. <laughs> one of their fingernails is too many for Don. <laughs> well, yeah, I've already eaten all the ones I have. <laughs> oh man. Wow. That is that's intense. Now, how do you let's say you're 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 getting a, a, a witness coming forward to you saying, you know, I'm not sure what I'm dealing with. Um, but, you know, it could be either a Sasquatch or, or a dog man. What, how would you, how do you differentiate or can you without a visual um, sighting? Is it impossible to figure out which it could be? Or no, it... not at all. Okay. It really depends on how good of a look the eyewitness got. But if they saw a muzzle, then it was a dog man. Some people would say, okay, well, a Googway, that's another nickname for a Type 3. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, if it had a muzzle, then it was either a dogman, such as a canine-type dogman, or a Type 3 dogman, a.k.a. a Googway, mm -hmm. or a Janosqua. That's another appellation for Type 3s. But, yeah, if they saw a muzzle, that really is the defining anatomical feature right there. Mm -hmm. That's easiest to pick out to know what you're dealing with if they didn't get a chance to look at the head but they did have a chance to look at the hands okay well did you notice claws or not if mm -hmm. they saw claws it was a dog man if it was hair covered and all the other pieces fit because there are other cryptids out there like goat men and whatnot rakes mm -hmm. but nonetheless yeah did you see claws if it kind of looked like a sasquatch it might have been a sasquatch or it might have been something else but it had claws well that right there makes it a situation where we're pretty much talking about a 95 percent chance or greater that it was a dog man oh so now are there you know as we know with uh and you you've got a foot in both worlds as far as bigfoot and dogman is concerned so um, I'm pretty sure you have the vocabulary for this, um, but there seems to be hallmarks of a Bigfoot encounter, like throwing rocks, like, um, tr tree breaks can be structures, can be, um, the, the knocking that that's reported. Mm -hmm. And, and, and of course the, the rancid smell, those are all hallmarks of their visit without actually seeing them. And, and so we've come to, to, you know, just to, to utilize those to say, well, you must be dealing with a Sasquatch. Now, what are the hallmarks of a, of a dog man presence? Well, how, how, well, how could you know they were there without no, without a sighting? Well, oh, that's an easy one to answer. Oh. Whereas with Sasquatch, in most cases, it would appear that they don't really have that much of an interest in interacting with us humans with dog men. In most cases, they're pushing the issue they're seeking out the eyewitnesses to force an encounter to happen. Now, I'm not mm -hmm. saying that in most cases when a dogman has the chance to make an encounter happen, it will. I don't have that information. I can't sure. say that. Mm -hmm. But it's obvious. Over the years of doing this and talking with thousands upon thousands of eyewitnesses, it is clear to me that in, I'd say, over 95% of the cases where I spoke with an eyewitness about their encounter, mm -hmm. it's crystal clear. The dog man, it made the encounter happen. It had every opportunity to remain hidden, but it pushed the issue and forced that encounter to happen. They don't really get into throwing things normally or, or doing the things that you mentioned that Sasquatch are known for doing. Mm -hmm. They just flat out, okay, well, no need for any of that. I'm just going to come and get in your face or, or at least make my presence known so that you see me and I frighten you to within an inch of your life and once I can see that that's done, that you are terrified to within an inch of your life, I move on. Now, having said that, yes, over the years, there have been four credible people who I've spoken with that told me that they actually were attacked by a dog man. Now, I can't share the details of those attacks, but sure. I will tell you, when you look at this number four over here, compared to this number over here on this side of the thousands upon thousands of eyewitnesses I've spoken with who were basically caught dead to rights by the dog man or dog men they encountered, 
but the dog man or dog men let them go without so much as a scratch. Looking at the math, that right there tells us that these things are not wired to be dangerous. Mm -hmm. I'm never going to tell an eyewitness that, okay, yeah, you never have anything to worry about when you're around a dog man because they're safe to be around. No, I'm not saying that. Sure. I'm just saying that the math points solidly to the fact that by nature, they are not wired to be dangerous. I've used this example before in other cases, I think on a show or two, mm -hmm. where basically I use example to kind of illustrate the fact that if you spoke with an entomologist, someone whose specialty was studying insects, an entomologist, for example, who focused on studying fire ants, mm -hmm. well, if they have been doing that for any period of time, you know that they will have spoken with who knows how many people who unfortunately came into direct contact with fire ants. Mm -hmm. You know what? I was playing with the kids in the backyard last weekend, and I was running around barefoot, and I stomped on a fire ant mound back there mm -hmm. that I didn't know was there. Thank goodness I got up and I brushed the fire ants off of me and thank goodness I never got a single sting. Right. Now we know that those words have never been uttered and that's for one reason and one reason only. That's because fire ants are not wired that way. Mm -hmm. If you stomp on a fire ant mound barefoot, especially you're going to get lit up and that's because <laughs> they're wired to be extremely aggressive mm -hmm. and they will attack if you do that sort of thing. Well, with dog men, when you look at all these opportunities, all these eyewitnesses gave the dog man mm -hmm. to attack them because they didn't know that the dog men were there. The dog men had them dead to rights. Well, if they were wired to be so dangerous, those people wouldn't be here. They wouldn't be talking with me. They wouldn't share their encounters. They would be dead. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's why the math clearly shows us that these things are not wired to be dangerous by nature. Again, certain things can happen oh, sure. where you push the wrong buttons and wind up with an attack. But the numbers bear out the fact that that is a very, very rare instance, a very rare occurrence. So that's mm -hmm. about the best way I can explain that. Wow. Yeah. Oh, that's perfect. That's that's a that sheds a lot of light on it because, of course, as you were just stating, they do force they do force the confrontations, and it's like, is is, is there a thrill in that for them? I mean, or is it just a real strong territorial display like the, I'm here now and and you're not going to be back here anymore? Or you know, what do you think the motivation is then? Because it's not they aren't killing people uh, at least not regularly or that we know of, but. Um, they could, they sure could at any moment. But what do you think the confrontations are for then? What is the purpose? Well, I think compared to Sasquatch that dogmen have a much more acerbic nature to them. But when you look at the fact that you're talking about a huge, very powerful, very well-equipped cryptid mm -hmm. with long claws, talons, some people, some people call them talons, sure. on the tips of their fingers and on the tips of their toes, big, powerful jaws with big, long, sharp teeth. I don't think they have very much trouble feeding themselves. <laughs> and that combined with the yeah. fact that they're so intelligent, that leaves a very capable, very intelligent predator, apex predator, with a lot of spare time on its hands. <laughs> It probably yeah. devotes maybe half an hour or maybe an hour at the most out of the 24-hour day feeding itself because yeah. think about it. How much effort does it have to expend to take down a deer? And once it has, it's got a huge meal right there. So yeah. that leaves it with all this spare time to waste. That leaves them with a lot of time to kill and uh, to occupy. So maybe we're their favorite pastime. Yeah, and we, we certainly hear that a lot from the Bigfoot world about them, you know, peeking in windows and, and watching what we're doing and, and uh, you know, obviously taking a big interest in what we're doing. So it, it's kind of interesting that that behavior may be shared by the dog man to me. Um, I guess, you know, we probably are the most exciting thing going on for them. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. Hmm. Now, as far as intelligence... Do you think that they are uh, like on our level of intelligence or is are they about as smart as the Sasquatch? Well, I mean, it's all speculation, obviously, but I'm just wondering what your opinion of that is. Well, I'm pretty sure they're at least as smart as Don over there. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, Don. 
I'm kidding. Oh my god. That's gosh, my I job. That. <laughs> Everybody knows Don gets beat up. It's okay. <laughs> and Cundiff lands a great uppercut. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, as far as their intelligence would go, no one's going to know for sure exactly how intelligent they are. But right. when you look at the things that they've done, mm-hmm. They must be really, really intelligent. I think their intelligence is borderline human level. Okay. I could be wrong about that, but over the years, hearing about the things that they've done from credible people, credible eyewitness after credible eyewitness, I think their intelligence does approach mm. human level. Okay. Wow. Which is, I, I guess that's good. I mean, they're smart enough to to know better, <laughs> you know, so that maybe yeah. is why they don't eat a bunch of people. But, uh, you know, because I mean, in natural terms, and I've said this on the show many times, in natural terms, we are like the slowest, weakest thing out there. I mean, we're, we're just lunch. We, we aren't fast. We aren't agile. We're not good swimmers. We're not, you know, I mean, we're all we can do is think pretty good. But, you know, I, I guess I'm glad that they're choosing not to. Um there was one question I was just dying to ask you, and now it slipped off my mind. But, um, I, I, oh, yeah, I remember what it was. I was wondering, uh, you know, again, with with signs and, and signals, uh, in terms of how we know a Sasquatch could possibly be in an area, uh, tree breaks, maybe footprints. Obviously, prints will always be a, an identifier for anything, but uh, wood knocking, et cetera. Are there any... Are there any key things that seem to be uh, trade, trademarks of the dogmen that they do to establish their presence in an area? Well, about the only thing I can think of that seems to be pretty reliable would be the, the gouges and tree trunks. Oh. Where I think they do that to brag and kind of demonstrate their strength and demonstrate their size. I mean, when you look up and see gouges, deep gouges in an oak tree, mm-hmm. five claw marks, deep claw marks that are maybe 16 feet up and mm. then raking down. Wow. I think that's really the only thing that they seem to reliably do to demonstrate their presence. Now they will do certain things like leave offerings. They'll kill animals and leave them for people sometimes on their doorstep, but that's mm. a lot more sporadic, wow. but wow. the gouges and trees, I don't think that's done for our benefit. Sometimes I think it is, but I think if they do that, it's not done on a regular basis for okay. us, it's done for other dogmen to kind of say, hey, I'm here. This is how big I am. This is how powerful I am. Wow. No, that brings up another question. Do, do, you, do they seem to have family groups or are they more solitary? Well, I get asked that a lot okay. as far as are dogmen seen alone or with other dogmen most of the time. In almost every case, the dogman that was reported was reported as being seen alone. And that makes sense. When you look at a wolf, Mm -hmm. the prey that wolves go after, they're normally so large that it's going to require more than one wolf to dispatch it. So with that in mind, it only makes sense that wolves are going to travel in packs Mm -hmm. and, and move about that way so that they can dispatch elk or moose or Mm -hmm. maybe even a bison, a sick bison. But with dogmen, you're talking about a creature that's so big and powerful and fast, it can dispatch anything that it comes across. It doesn't need help. And also, too, when you look at the fact that it's going to have such a huge, ridiculously huge daily caloric requirement mm-hmm. that if you have a number of dogmen in a particular area, yeah, they're going to deplete the resources so quick sure. that it just wouldn't be in their best interest to make any habit out of hanging out together. So yeah. I think when you see dogmen together, I think that's definitely the exception and not the norm. Well, you know, that brings up another question because people speculate that Sasquatch may or may not migrate do dogmen have this tendency or do they particularly like to, uh, you know, get a den and, and just stay there? Are they solitary in that sense? Like, you know, or, or would they migrate? Do you think? Well, understand Sasquatch do have an advantage. The dogmen don't Sasquatch. They're omnivores, whereas dogmen, they're obligate carnivores. Mm. So yeah. Whereas an area might have a lot more to offer for a Sasquatch, a group of Sasquatches. Yeah. For dogmen, if they don't have meat sources to feed upon, then their options are really limited with that in mind. Yeah. I'm convinced the dogmen, just like another, any other large predator, they're going to have a huge home range that they just move around 
from time to time. They can be found in any part of that home range, but it just makes sense that they would move like that because if they didn't, then almost overnight they would deplete their resources and they would starve if they didn't move that way. Sure, excellent. Okay. That's really interesting. And, and I got to ask you, um, this was a question that was uh, sent to me earlier, but there's these reports of, of dogmen seen in the company of Bigfoot. Do, do, uh, do you suppose they could be cooperative mm. or are they? Because I've heard both sides. I've heard that uh, they have very established territories and are very territorial towards each other. And then I've heard that, yeah, they hang out together. So um, do you have any insight on that, Vic? I do. Yeah, I think it happens, but not with any regularity. No, I think normally dogmen and Sasquatch, they mix like oil and water. Mm -hmm. There have been plenty of credible people who reported seeing dogmen stalking Sasquatch, but understand too, it depends on the size of the Sasquatch and it also depends on the size of the dogmen also. But sure. yeah, people have seen dogmen prints right alongside Sasquatch prints and said, okay, well, that must mean they're traveling together. Well, Maybe, maybe not. Oh, okay. I mean, people have seen dogmen stalking Sasquatch. If that's the case, then if you see those prints side by side, then in that case, yeah, the Sasquatch came through, and then the dogman that was trailing it, tracking it, it would come through. So, mm. yeah, I think that's... I think that's a situation where it's definitely the exception in most cases rather than the norm. Okay. Wow. Yeah, I, I, I found that interesting because... Um, there was, what was it? I don't know. There was a story where, where there, there was the family that lived basically in between the two ranges on one side of the, of their, uh, property area was a, a pack of Bigfoot or a family group of Bigfoot. And on the other side was this pack of dogmen and, and they seemed to be extraordinarily territorial. And I can't remember the story. And, and as I was telling you before, I'm no good at, at, uh, trying to, to recall those events clearly, but, um, it, it it is interesting to me that that they have been seen that way, and I don't know. I you know it makes you wonder how would they even communicate because I I don't imagine they have a common tongue between them. Um, but is there a dogman language? That I don't know. Okay. I can tell you that there have been plenty of credible eyewitnesses <clears throat> who have reported being telepathically communicated with okay. by the dogman they encountered. I don't know if there really is anything to that or not. All I can tell you is these people that I spoke with, they didn't give me any reason to believe that they were telling a lie. Mm -hmm. But yeah, whether they have some kind of a language or not, I don't know. Maybe they can communicate in body language. Mm -hmm. That's just a guess. I don't really know about that. But something I wanted to share with you to kind of expand on the last question you asked about sure. whether they spend time together with Sasquatch. Yeah, there have been countless examples where people who had Sasquatch living on their property or around their property pretty much year round and they habituated them, had a relationship with them. I guess if you could call that having a relationship with a Sasquatch or sure. Sasquatch family. But once dogmen moved into the area or even a dogman, there could be a whole family of Sasquatch and one dogman mature big dog man moved into the area the sasquatch moved out they left mm. i can't say that that's always the way it is but there have been plenty of instances where that did happen so yeah in most cases i stick to my guns on that and i'm gonna say that in most cases that they they don't spend time together they just don't yeah. mix and that that would seem to be most natural to me i mean you know it's like you don't you don't see bear and wolves hanging out together and you know any any apex predators like that you would think they wouldn't want that extra you know that extra challenge for the for the food sources around right, so right. and i imagine as you were saying about the caloric intake needs of a dogman probably a, a small bigfoot would be easy prey you know and maybe oh, even yeah. big maybe even big bigfoot <laughs> i don't know uh you know the head to heads on that one i've heard i've heard stories on both sides of that as well um, you know, Bigfoot uh, took down a dogman and then another one dogman took down a Bigfoot. And I, you know, I don't know. It's, it's hard to know, but I, I don't know. There's so, so many questions about, about these things. And it's, it's such a, I guess I'm learning a lot already, Vic. You're, mm -hmm. you're really uh, schooling us here. <laughs> and I love that I, because it is, it isn't easy to track down this information. And it certainly isn't easy to track down credible information. 
on this subject because there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, uh, people making some incredible claims. So I, I'm absolutely thrilled that you're here to fill in these gaps and help us understand this a little better. Well, like I said, thanks for having me and glad to do it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now you had t- you had mentioned about witness reporting, and there seems to be some issue with uh, you know getting an, a, an approximate uh, size weight uh, from from witnesses. And I'd love for you to elaborate on that. Well, where should I start? <laughs> <laughs> At the beginning, sure. Ba- Back when I had enough time to be a true connoisseur of podcasts, I'd love to just sit and listen to Sasquatch-related podcasts or mm-hmm. or cryptid-related podcasts in general. And one thing that would just drive me crazy is when I listen to an eyewitness or when I would listen to an eyewitness talk about how they saw this Sasquatch that was 11 feet tall. Mm-hmm. And then when the host wants to know how much they thought it weighed, oh, it must have weighed at least 400 pounds. <laughs> Or 500 pounds. And I'm thinking, oh, boy. Right. Yeah, that's not right. <laughs> yeah, I have to admit, that's really a pet peeve of mine. Mm-hmm. People who see Sasquatch and Dogmen, they don't intentionally flub the estimates on how much they weigh. But in almost every case, they're way off. Yeah. I know that as a fact, and I'll tell you why. There's a scientific principle called square cube law. And that law basically states... If you double the size of any object, if the proportions of that object remain the same, then the weight of that object is going to be increased by a factor of eight. Mm -hmm. So if you double the size of an object that is 100 pounds, then, yeah, it's hard to believe, but that object will now be 800 pounds. I'll illustrate that for you. If you take, to keep this simple, if you take blocks that are one foot wide by one foot tall by one foot front to back, and each one of those blocks weighed one pound. Okay. Okay. That block, if you had to describe the size of that block, you would say, of course, it's one cubic foot Mm -hmm. in size. Okay. If you wanted to know how much a two cubic foot block that's made of the same material would weigh, what you can do is you can take a bunch of those one foot by one foot by one foot blocks and use those to form a two foot tall cube Mm -hmm. that's two feet wide and two feet front to back. Well, we know to form a cube that size, it would take eight of those one foot by one foot by one foot blocks. So yeah, now it's doubled in size, but its weight has been increased by a factor of eight. Now, some people, years ago, I had some people in this chat room say, no, that's not right, that's not right, Vic, that's crazy. Look at kids. (laughs) Kids can be three feet tall. I'm a 200-pound man. And my Mm -hmm. son, who's three feet tall, he doesn't weigh, I'm not sure exactly what 200 divided by eight would be, but he doesn't weigh that much. Well, understand Square cube law states that as long as the proportions remain the same, kids, they don't have the same proportions that an adult would have. Their arms and legs are shorter proportionally to their bodies than what an adult's uh, arms and legs would be. Their heads are proportionally larger than what an adult's would be. They just don't have the same proportions. Mm -hmm. But we can draw that conclusion in animals by using, say, a Great Dane and a horse, for example. It's not too hard to find a Great Dane that's three feet tall at the withers. And there are Great Danes that do push the 200-pound mark. Well, if you talk about a horse that's six feet tall at the withers, that's a pretty big horse. Mm -hmm. That's that's light to kind of medium draft horse territory right there. Well, a horse that's about six feet at the withers, it's not uncommon to find a horse that height that pushes the scales at 1,600 pounds. Well, guess what? 200 times eight is. Now, horses and Great Danes, they don't have the same proportions. Their proportions aren't identical. But when it comes to dogs, Great Danes, have proportions that are about as close to a horse's as you can find. So yeah, square square cube law, it works. It's a reality. 
So when you look at the fact that a human who's six feet tall, a man who's six feet tall, he weighs 200 pounds, if you want to translate that into a 12-foot tall Sasquatch, well, if that Sasquatch had the proportions of a man, obviously a Sasquatch is going to be much more robust than a man. So this Sasquatch that's 12 feet tall would weigh quite a bit more than 1,600 pounds. But if that 12-foot-tall Sasquatch had the same proportions of a man, then it would still weigh 1,600 pounds. Wow. So if you're talking about a 12-foot-tall Sasquatch, who if you shrunk it down to six feet in height, it would still be a lot wider than that six-foot-tall man. It would still have shoulders and arms and legs and a body that's a lot thicker and more robust than that six-foot-tall man. Do you see what I'm getting at here? Mm Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. That's that. That's great. I, I think that's that's marvelous, uh, and it, it it makes perfect sense to me. Um, that's great illustration. Um, we got a question from a chatter uh, asking, "Have you had a cryptid encounter yourself, Vic? Any kind of a cryptid?" Well, when I was hunting, and I'm an animal lover, I'll be the first person to admit that. Sure. But yeah, years ago. I was, it was about 40 years ago, actually, I was hunting a neighbor that lived two doors down from me. He told me about how he wanted to take me out hunting when season opened up, deer hunting that is. So he took me to his farm way out in the sticks. And he told me the night before opening of the season that, okay, well, tomorrow morning before dawn, we're going to get up and we're going to have breakfast and then head out about maybe half an hour before daylight. And I'm going to take you about a mile away from here and stake you out in this hollow. And then I'm going to move on after you get settled. I'll move on to maybe a hollow that's maybe one or two ridges away from you. And then we're going to spend the day where we're at. You're going to be there all day. I'm going to be over there all day. Mm -hmm. Well, we did that. And yeah, he walked me out there to my spot. I sat down, got comfy. He moved on to wherever he went off to. And I stayed there until probably about noon, maybe one o'clock, I guess it was. Well, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself here. He did warn me when I got there to his farm that he had this horse named Red Mm -hmm. that could be kind of dangerous to people who didn't know it. And he told me to stay away from Red because he's probably going to bite you or kick you if you do go anywhere near him. Well, I'm sitting there with my tree up against – I'm sorry. I'm sitting there with my back (laughs) against this huge tree trunk. And all of a sudden, I hear this loud horse whinny. And it's right behind me. I mean, it sounded like it was just maybe 10, 20 feet behind me, I would guess. Mm. Well, at first, I thought, oh, no, Red followed us all the way out here. (laughs) And then reality struck. Here I am on this really steep bank of this hollow that was way too steep for a horse to ever think about going on. And number two, there was leaf cover all over the place. If he wanted to come to where I heard that sound coming from, I would have heard him miles away. Right. So I never did see a Sasquatch in that instance, but the only thing that fits would have been that a Sasquatch was messing with me. It was probably, unfortunately, right behind that tree trunk at one point or the other. So, yeah, I think I had a Sasquatch behind me, i.e. a cryptid encounter, but, yeah, I never did see it. Mm, wow. wow. Yeah, that's uh, my encounter, too, was just hearing uh, a deep, resonant growl that shook my body. Um, and it, it was, yeah, I just couldn't turn around. I mean, I could have physically, I just couldn't emotionally because I thought whatever made that noise is going to kill me. And, uh, it was the most terrified I've ever been in my life. And now listening to you talk about dog, man, <laughs> maybe it was a dog, man. No, now I'm just more terrified. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's hard to know. Um, we have another question from our chat. I'm, I'm trying to keep up with them. There's a lot there's, of questions. There's a lot of questions. Well, Don, you've been watching. What yeah. Are, you know, one of, one of the questions, and, and I believe you've, you've kind of uh, gone over this real quick, but somebody asks, um, uh, do, do they communicate with us? And if they do, do they do it through um, um, telepathy? And I think you mentioned it. So if you could give a little bit more on that. Well, any time that an eyewitness reported communication happening, it's always been in the form of telepathy. Okay. Now, again, I don't know if there was anything to that, if it was maybe imagined, but it's reported enough where I think there is something to it. I don't think the eyewitnesses imagined it. But any time 
an eyewitness has reported to me that they had some form of communication going on. It was always in the form of telepathy, never verbal speech. Wow. Oh, that's incredible. Yeah, it is. Now, uh, uh, one of our chatters, Les, he's asking, what would be the odds of one or more dogmen living in close proximity of a city with a wooded subdivision? So you mentioned, you talked a little bit about that. What about in a, in a city type subdivision setting? Oh, these things are so bold that whereas you would think a Sasquatch would be kind of put off by that, but Sasquatch do come in and they do occupy areas pretty close to where we live, mm -hmm. right on the fringes of where we live. But yeah, dogmen, they're so much more bold that they're a lot more likely to do that. Mm -hmm. They're not put off by the fact that people are here, people are there. No, they're going to go where they want to go and they're going to do what they want to do and that's all there is to it. Wow. No, I think that that the chances of running into a cryptid on the fringes of a suburb or some other place like that, if you run into a cryptid, I think you're much more likely to run into a dogman than you would be a Sasquatch because of how bold they are. There are people, people have spoken, have told me about instances where they've been inside the city limits of major metropolitan areas where dogmen came right in, broad daylight. They came into the, the developed areas. So how's that for bold? Yeah. You know, there are, there are Sasquatch uh, reports from <laughs> Detroit and, and Chicago mm -hmm. and, you know, the city. So, yeah, it wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't uh, surprise me at all if these things were that bold because we know that uh, Sasquatch have been pr pr reported to be as bold if, you know, in that sense, you know, of the doing what they will, you know, maybe we're talking about a rogue squatch or, you know, whatever, you know, a loner, whatever that may be. But, you know, there, it certainly makes sense to me that, that dog men would pretty much do what they want. Um, so there is a story from, um, Skinwalker Ranch. Uh, and I heard this years ago on, on, uh, Mr. Art Bell's show years ago. I think it was like 96 or 97. Uh, he was talking to some people who were, um, uh, you know, investigating Skinwalker Ranch. And they said that they were out there on a hillock one night and they had a camera and a telescope. And, f uh, I don't remember if it was infrared or if it was FLIR, but, oh, well, yeah. So anyhow, um, but they said that they saw a portal open up and what they believe to be a dog man come out. Now, this is leading up to the question. Uh, one of our chatters, Titan, uh, he's asking, does Vic suppose there are any supernatural elements to dog man? If you do this for any period of time, you're going to bounce back and forth from at one point being convinced that they are supernatural in origin to being convinced that they must be flesh and blood. To illustrate my point, if they're supernatural, then why are they seen on a regular basis eating rotting carcasses, roadkill carcasses on the side of the road, drinking stagnant water out of nasty ponds, showing that that females must be fecund. Seeing females moving around, dog women, I guess you could call them, moving around with pups. Mm -hmm. So if they're supernatural, why would people report that? Credible eyewitnesses report that. Then on the other hand, if they were flesh and blood, why are so many reputable, credible eyewitnesses reporting seeing them doing things that point soundly towards them being supernatural in origin. So you bounce back and forth from one moment to the next, mm -hmm. being convinced that they are flesh and blood to being convinced that they're not. So I can't really answer that question for you. I don't know. I don't know. All I can do is guess on that. Sure. Yeah. I think that's, that's fair enough to it. But in the same thing would be true. If, you know, when I first started doing the show, I was sure that Bigfoot was this, you know, this hominid. It was, it was just a hominid that had somehow evaded us. But through the years, reading stories, talking to people that have witnessed things firsthand, you know, I gotta, I gotta think, you know, can they all be wrong? Can they, can they all be telling me just a bunch of bunk? Well, I suppose it's possible, but just in talking to people and what they've witnessed, I, I, I've just come to the point where I have at least an open mind for the idea 
which is a big stretch for me because, you know, I tend to be a logical person in many regards. And it's, you know, some of that stuff is really hard to get your head around. But I, I've got to tell you that I'm, you know, I'm kind of in the same place where I'm, I'm, I don't know for sure, but at least I think anything is possible. Oh, no, I agree. I agree. <clears throat> wow. It's, it's so far, I've just been like, you know, literally on the edge of my seat because, <laughs> you know, we, we hear so many things about, um, you know, dogmen and how aggressive they are. And, you know, we get this picture of this violent, snarling, you know, blood dripping, fangy, you know, <laughs> creature. Um, but you have pointed out, you've pointed out that in the reports you've had, you've had four out of the thousands you've gotten that have reported attacks. Has there ever been bodies found that were, that were possibly associated with a, a, a dog man attack that ended in the loss of life? Yes, there have been. Most people who follow the dogman phenomenon, they know about the supposed murders that took place in the LBL, Land Between the Lakes, mm -hmm. right there at the border of Kentucky and Tennessee. Well, yeah, over the years, I've kind of changed my tune from doubting the legitimacy of those to being pretty much convinced that that really did happen. But, yeah, there was an instance, if you don't know what happened down there or supposedly happened, there was a family who was camping out in the LBL in this RV. And it would appear that a dog man killed, attacked and killed the husband, the wife who was there, the son, and there was also a daughter. The daughter was found in a tree. Her remains, that is, were found in this tree. But... That happened, and then later on, years later, there was a bow hunter who apparently was killed and then dragged off miles away from his tent. Wow. But, yeah, those two inc incidents, for a long time, I thought it was just something that someone made up. But as time has gone by, after talking with certain people, yeah, I do believe that those actually did happen. Wow. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's absolutely terrifying. And, you know, there wouldn't be a thing you could do. <laughs> no. We'd have absolutely no, without, without even firearms. Now, that's another point, Vic, that I wanted to talk with you is, is the stories upon stories upon stories of people shooting these things and surely mm -hmm. shooting them. Like, they, they can see where the bullet impacted, but it doesn't seem to phase them. And, and it, what is that all about? I mean, I don't believe they're bulletproof, but are they just that hard to kill or what's going on? That's a really good question. I mean, I've spoken with eyewitnesses, credible eyewitnesses, who have talked about, well, I guess one eyewitness at least, mm -hmm. who talked about shooting one with a forty five seventy more Man. than once, wow. and that didn't get the job done. So, yeah, it really does make you wonder, what does it take? And if that's the case, if there are so many instances where people have fired on these things, people who don't tend to be the kind of person to miss, if you know what I mean, yeah. with formidable weaponry, and that still didn't take the dogman down, that does make you wonder, okay, well, are they ethereal in nature after all? Mm -hmm. Because a flesh and blood entity, I don't care... If you think they have some kind of funky reinforced rib cage or any of the other ideas I've seen floated around there. No, no, they don't have some kind of Kevlar reinforced rib cages because they're genetically engineered mm -hmm. monsters that the government set loose. They might be genetically engineered. Some might be genetically engineered, but yeah, it's just impossible to explain away how so many people could fire on these things with formidable weaponry and not take them down. I don't know what what's behind that. I don't know how to explain that unless they are supernatural and in origins. I don't know. That's a tough one. Yeah, I, I wrestle with that one too because I mean, you know, I've shot a bunch. I've shot a lot of different caliber and and you know, if it's going to go through a, a you know, like a 4x4 four four oak post I can't imagine that there's any body that would resist that same right. round, you know, yeah. and, or any, any mm -hmm. amount of bone, you know, and I suppose, you know, I know like elephant guns are a huge gun, but you know, if you've got a, a like a, a, a real a full metal jacket round and you know, it's fired from a decent caliber, it should be tearing through everything physical. Um, but yeah, 
and, and it, that just always bothered me because how how <laughs> how yeah how? how how is that happening what's going on because i don't get it um now you, you hear the same reports about people shooting bigfoot allegedly and and uh, uh in those in several reports that i've heard from these claims they're dropping these animals or these beings i don't want to call them animals because i don't want to be you know degrading or whatever but but you know not so for the dogman and that just really perplexes me but again you know i, I know we don't have an answer but just it's such a curious thing. I don't know. We got another. It question. is. Yeah. Um, let, let's see. What is this question? Does Vic think? Uh, oh, what does Vic think about the popping sound that occurs during some encounters? And I think what the person's referring to is people that have seen them quadrupedally and then moving to to bipedally. Um, there's claims of of like a popping sound. Well, it's funny you mentioned that. After one of the episodes where the eyewitness talked about witnessing that, I think it was the day after, or maybe two days after that episode aired, that a surgeon contacted me, reached out to me, and he talked about how if they have a hip structure that's basically designed to allow them to ambulate both quadrupedally and bipedally, that it would make sense that as the hip joints realigning itself, to transition from one to the other, that you would hear that popping sound. Now, I'm just a layman. I don't sure. know how accurate that postulation is. I don't know if, if there really is something to that. All I can tell you is that someone who appeared to be a, phys a physician contacted me and told me that that would make sense. Mm -hmm. So, gosh, that's out of my... Yeah, that's out of my clubhouse. I couldn't really tell you for <laughs> sure any more than that about that. Right. You know, that makes sense, though, because me just getting out of bed sounds like that, I'm sure. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's like, you know, you go from that totally rested position to having to get up and your hip pops, your shoulder pops, your neck pops. <laughs> I can relate. Yeah. <laughs> Standing up is, is a hard thing to do in the morning. But uh, yeah. <laughs> you, you just transition from prone position to bipedal. Yeah. And it's full of noise. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Snap, crackle, and pop. Oh, yeah. I don't need to eat. I've already had breakfast. <laughs> All right. But. Huh. We yeah we've got uh, you know a lot of questions I don't think I'm hitting even half of them they're flying by. Well, but... here's an interesting one. Carlton Please. sent this in uh, pharmacy. He says, uh, uh, "Will Vic talk about the Fed agents that showed up on a few cases with special electronic equipment?" Hmm. Well, anyone who listened to the episode episode 190 where Brandon Close came on and talked about that i think he came back for episode 191 also and talked about that but you know as much about that as i do okay. the feds some alphabet letter team showed up the next day after he contacted his local sheriff and told him about this dogman problem that he had on his property in rural new york state and yeah, the next day or maybe two days after that, this team, this federal team showed up and he says that they had this dish that could emit some kind of a strong sonic pulse that was basically like a hopped up dog whistle mm. in effect. And they think that drove the dog man off. I don't really know any more than that mm -hmm. about what happened or what supposedly happened or or any more than any of you who listened to that episode. So mm, sure. I don't really have anything more for you on that. Speaking wow. of upstate uh, New York, uh, I was talking with Adam of Blue Line Bigfoot, and, and he just wanted me to relay that uh, he, he wanted to thank you for all the help you gave Clara, apparently. And, and I, I don't know anything more than that, but he just said, you know, to make sure to mention that if I would. So from Blue Line Bigfoot, guys, thank you for helping Clara. Does that make sense? You're welcome. Okay. <laughs> all right huh. i just had to make sure to do that oh yeah he's a, he's in the chat right now so very cool wow. i did it adam i remembered <laughs> uh, you're, you're welcome <laughs> wow now i know we've got some uh audio files that you sent along and i i know the conversation was just going so crazy i couldn't bring myself to stop it i know so um but uh ladies and gentlemen vic sent a couple of uh sound files uh from from the the dogman encounters show and uh, we're going to play a few of those for you guys. And you're going to hear some of what goes on, on on the show there. But I think we'll start out with the narrated story, Vic. Okay? 
Sounds good. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is from uh, from Dogman Encounters episode. So, here we go. All right. Launch. I live in southern Ohio near the Ohio River. A few friends and I decided to go explore an abandoned hospital that backs up to a giant hill and large forest across the river in Maysville, Kentucky. It was a local spot for dumb teenagers to go and scare each other and make out with their girlfriends so running into <laughs> other people wasn't uncommon. You could usually tell if other people were there because there would be cars parked near it. That being said, on this night we were the only dumb teenagers there. The moment we got out of the car, though, everything felt wrong. We knew we weren't allowed to be there because the building was condemned, but it felt like we were actually in danger, which, of course, we always were because it was condemned. It just felt different, though. Now, by this time, I had been to Hayeswood Hospital 20 times or so and was familiar with the layout. Once the three of us had been inside about 45 minutes, we split up to tag some different places and explore. I went to go take pictures of the morgue in the basement to see if I could photograph any orbs or anything really cool. I had been in the morgue about 10 minutes when I smelled the foulest smell I've ever smelled. It was rot. I didn't know what was rotting. I imagined it was a large dog or a coyote, but all I could make out was that it was about 40 pounds of rotting meat. I had just started to look at the meat junk when I heard a steel door slam and what sounded like something running through puddles of water, which meant whatever it was, it was in the basement with me because the floor had about three inches of water standing on it. So naturally, I figured it was my friends playing a prank on me. That was when I decided to get them back and scare them before they could scare me. Now, the way the morgue was set up, you could actually climb on top of the coolers they used to store the bodies, so I hopped up there and laid in wait to scare the crap out of my friends. I had been there no more than a minute when I heard screaming. Now, I've known my friends my entire life, which at this point had been 19 years. I've never heard screaming like this before. The screaming stopped and I heard hard footsteps running above me in what I could best describe as pounding. Now, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't freaking out a little bit because this wasn't like my friends. It was usually hide behind a corner and jump out and go gotcha. This was different. This was dread I was starting to feel. As I continued to lay there, about five minutes had passed when I heard panting and footsteps in the water. They were getting closer. That was when I smelled wet dog, but it wasn't just wet dog I was smelling. I was smelling that same smell of rot, too. Then, another steel door slammed, and I could tell it was the same door I passed before I got to the morgue's door. The panting was even louder now, and honestly, it sounded more like labored breathing and sniffing. Now, at this point, I was terrified. I tried to slowly back away from the edge of the cooler I was on so I could slip behind the wall the cooler backs up to and drop into the boiler room. I was almost to the end of the cooler when I heard the morgue door slam open and break the tiles on the wall with the door handle. I was less than 35 feet from whatever was panting and smelling like death, and all I could do was think, run, run, run. I could hear the sniffing, and then I heard the deepest, most menacing growl I'd ever heard. The movies and shows don't do justice to just how deep and rough a growl of that size sounds. It was sniffing me out. It was actually smelling where I had been. I dropped down behind the wall in the boiler room and thanked God that the door that connected the morgue to it was blocked with old gurneys and a locker on its side because I thought that would stop that thing from getting in. I was wrong, so very wrong about that. I hadn't been in the boiler room 30 seconds before I heard pounding and scratching on the steel door. It sounded like Freddy Krueger was trying to carve his way through the steel door. Then I heard a sound that still haunts me to this day. It howled, and I mean it bellowed a howl so loud I had to cover my ears. Now on the other side of the boiler room was access to the generator, the dock doors trucks used to unload, and the hillside that leads to the woods. When I reached the other side of the room, I could hear this thing slamming into the door and knocking the lockers and gurneys away. I opened the door to the dock room, and when I looked back, I saw the arm of this creature sticking through the opening it had made, and it was like a horror movie. It was a gray and brown mass of fur. It looked like a human arm, but in a way it didn't because the hand was all wrong. The hand had five digits, but the claws would have made a bear run in fear. I slammed the door behind me and ran for the dock doors. The dock doors wouldn't budge. I could hear the gurneys overturning and the lockers sliding on the floor. 
It was getting through, and the only thing between me and it now was a single door. I ran to one of the windows by the dock doors and proceeded to bust it out, which mangled my hand from the glass. Then, as I was pulling myself through the window, I heard the door get slammed into, and one of the hinges completely flew off the door and hit the wall. I tumbled out of the window and hit the cold, wet ground. When I stood up, I saw it in the doorway. Now I'm six foot four, two hundred and fifty pounds, not little by any means, and this thing took up the entire eight foot tall by three foot wide doorway. It was covered head to toe in gray brown fur and had a very narrow snout, almost like a Doberman pincher. Its ears were just barely visible because of the doorway, but I could tell they were pointing up just like a dog's. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I was completely paralyzed. This thing was staring right into my soul, looking at every delicious part it was going to enjoy. I've never felt like an item on a menu before, but I can tell you, it's terrifying. Then it snarled, and that woke me from my disbelief of what I was seeing. I turned and ran. I ran up the hill into the woods to get around the hospital and get back to the street where the car was parked. I hadn't made it 25 feet when I heard it clawing to get out the window. I knew I would never make it to the car this way, so I ran back towards the hospital where the fire escape ladder was. I had used the ladder before to climb to the roof to take pictures of the entire town. I completely skipped the first three rungs on the ladder and now was inside the enclosed part of the fire escape. Again, this thing howled and I could feel waves of pure terror filling my body. My hand was killing me at this point and I was getting blood on everything. Just as I was reaching a first floor window I could climb into, this thing slammed into the fire escape ladder, knocking me down a couple of rungs. Then it leaped onto the outside of the fire escape and began clawing at my feet. Just as I reached the window, I felt it, pain like nothing I'd ever felt. It had grabbed me just above my ankle and yanked, and in doing so, shredded my boot, the end of my jeans, and my flesh. I was able to pull myself into the first floor window and heard it push itself off the fire escape and head back the way it came. Now at this point I was dragging my left leg and was trying to keep my right hand in my hoodie pocket. The entrance we came in was only about 150 feet away down the main hall and around a left turn. As I was halfway down the hall I heard the steel doors slamming again. I was dragging myself down the hall just trying to stay focused on getting out of this hellhole when the howling started again. I could hear it getting closer. I made the turn and heard pounding coming up the stairs from the basement. I made it to the entrance then and heard the padding of hands and feet on the floor. I made the mistake of looking back just as it rounded the corner and saw that it was running on all fours like a real dog. I bolted down the hill towards the street where the car was parked and realized the car was gone. They left me. My only means of escape was gone. I just zoned out and kept running down the hill. My leg was throbbing, my hand was in agony, and all I could think was, I'm going to be dog kibble. Finally, I made it to the first house I could find and ran full force into the door. I began pounding on it like a crazy person, and thank God this little old lady was home because she opened the door. When she did, I literally fell inside, and just before I kicked the door closed, standing up on two legs at the end of her driveway was this monster. I broke down in tears. I didn't know what to do. Luckily, the old lady had called the cops because a crazy person who was bleeding everywhere just fell into her home. When the cops got there and asked me what happened, I told them the same thing I've said here, and of course they didn't believe me. They thought I was on drugs. The EMTs took me to the hospital, and when they did blood work and found no substance in my system, they concluded I was attacked by a wild dog. I ended up with 36 stitches in my leg and 17 in my hand. I had to get rabies shots and tell the local wildlife officer my story. He informed me that they had reports of wild dog packs running around outside the town, ransacking garbage cans and killing some of the local pets. I informed him that it wasn't a pack of wild dogs. It was a giant dog man, but they all just thought I was crazy. The only thing I had in my favor was the claw mark on my leg. Even the doctors were confused about how a wild dog could make a mark like that. Now you know my story and you know why I absolutely know we're not at the top of the food chain. I've never been back to Hayeswood Hospital and I've deterred anyone from ever going there. That experience has haunted me for the last 11 years of my life. It's made me into the overcautious man I am. 
I always have to know where every exit is when I walk into a building, and I always have to know where large clumps of woods are. This experience changed me forever, and it changed the way I look at the world we live in. Just because we all haven't seen something doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It just means some people haven't been hunted for their life. I have no doubt what stalked me that night was the dog man. I know it in my bones. Wow. That is so intense. Wow. Oh, yeah. my God. You know, you just, you know, like you said, you know, just dumb kids out doing dumb kid things, you know, and this is the kind of, you know, encounter you have. You end up at some little old lady's house and they, the cops take you off to the hospital and they make you, you know, give up blood and and, <laughs> and try to figure out what you're on this time. Uh-huh. Um, you know, well, he didn't say this time, but what you're on. You know, because it is an unbelievable story, you know, being, you know, attacked in the in, a, in an abandoned morgue and getting out the window and it pounding it, chasing you all the way down. You know, um, I wonder if there's something that um, pre pre, you know, uh, what went on before uh, with this dog man or if it was just maybe he was just too close to, you know, where the dog man's den was. What if he was you know, habitating that, that, that old rundown abandoned, uh, hospital. Yeah. I don't know. What do you think, Vic? Oh, did we lose Vic? Ooh, let me see what's going on. He might not know we're back. Sorry about that. Had my mute on oh. on Skype. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Sorry about that. <laughs> Rookie. Yeah, it's possible a dog man that takes up residence in an old abandoned hospital like that. I don't think if you come into the hospital, it's going to see that as a challenge and come after you for that reason. I think if you come into the <clears> hospital <throat> in that situation, you just basically presented yourself as a source of entertainment, and I think that's why I came after him that way. Mm, okay, see, so it, it probably yeah, can't, wasn't going to devour him, but it was just trying to terrorize him. That's right. Yeah, that's my guess. Mm. Wow. I, you got to admit, though, I mean, could you – It's see, the hard part is is to put yourself in that situation – with any kind of accuracy, because I, I think it's one thing to have a mental image of it, but I just can't imagine being in that situation and seeing that huge, terrifying yeah. thing coming at you. I mean, how, 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 do you, how could this even person even move is, is beyond me. I guess it's the whole fight or flight thing, but uh, I mean, it's hard to understand the gravity of that situation without being in that situation. Or some type, yeah, some type of that situation, yeah. Or, or to even appreciate the gravity of that situation, you know, and I don't mean appreciate in a good way, but just, to, you know, I, I mean, that, that is the kind of thing that would, that would, could destroy a person afterwards. And it sounds like this person still has issues from that experience. Oh, yeah, when you have an experience like that with something that's not supposed to exist, yeah, it definitely could ruin you. But understand, I always tell eyewitnesses, in most cases, eyewitnesses have trouble dealing with their encounters because of their inability, due to no fault of their own, of course, due to human nature. Human nature is to blame. But most eyewitnesses have so much trouble dealing with their encounters because of their inability to see their encounters accurately for what they were. And consequently, they don't see the dog men or the dog man that was involved in their encounter accurately for what it was and what it was all about and why it did what it did and whatnot. People will tell me time after time about the dog man or dog men that they got away from. You won't believe this, Vic. 20 years ago, I was... When I would get bored, I would go to this national forest I lived close to, and back then, I got bored a lot, so I wound up taking a lot of walks (laughs) in that forest. Well, I went for a walk one day in that forest. I was about 700 yards from my truck, and all of a sudden, this giant werewolf-looking thing jumps out right in front of me, and it must have been 9 feet tall, 10 feet tall, Vic, and it's just snarling and snapping in my face. So I spun on my heels, and I bolted all 700 yards back for the truck. Now, understand, Vic, I've always been a lightning-fast runner. In fact, back in college, I was an (laughs) all-state sprinter. Thank goodness I was so fast. 
I was able to at least barely outrun that dog man all 700 yards, Vic, back to the truck. Now, every time I'd look over my shoulder, Vic, it was about four to six feet behind me. Every time I would check, it was four to six feet behind me, Vic. But thank goodness I was just fast enough to outrun that dog man, that monster, back to the truck. All 700 yards back to the truck that day time wow. after time guys i'll talk with an eyewitness or eyewitnesses that just don't get it they yeah. just don't get it it's no fault of their own it's due to human nature like i said mm -hmm. i'm not telling them anything that they didn't know they were just taken off their game so much by the trauma of the encounter that they were unable to see it accurately for what it really was and consequently like i said for what the dog man was really out to do. Right. So, yeah, it's my job to remind them to get them back on track, to point out the obvious <laughs> and get them to realize, okay, yeah, you might have been really fast, but you did not run that dog man 700 yards back to the truck. <laughs> right. It was yeah. toying with you. Right. And if it was toying with you, then you have yet in your life to encounter a bloodthirsty, mindless, monstrous killer that wants to rip your face off and eat it as soon as look at you. So, yeah, once you point out what they've missed, the pink elephant in the room, then that right there, that that makes it so much easier to get them to deal with their encounters in a healthy way. Well, wow. And also it, it, attribu it attributes an intelligence to the thing because I think a lot of people think it's the mindless killing machine. That's what it is. Right. It doesn't think about it. It just needs to do it. But when you present that, that, uh, that argument or that, or that point, then it, it it gives the the dog man so much more depth, and it gives it a personality or at least uh, you know some intelligence. And I right. think that that can help people cope because you know if 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 you're afraid of sharks, well sharks eat stuff. That's what they do. <laughs> that's how they live, and that's how they propagate and survive. And if you're in the water and the shark's hungry, they're going to eat you. But to know that this has an intelligence, it's discerning. It you know it made a choice. It was just you know monkeying around. Um, you know, I, I think that would help me cope personally. It's like, well, oh, okay. It was just playing. All right. Well, that's n not nearly as bad as I had it in my head. Um, but right. I, well, and, 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 and I think it's funny because, you know, I'll be out throwing the ball for my boxer, you know, and my boxer is only, you know, two and a half foot tall at most, not very big either. But I know for a fact that my boxer as small as it is with its four little legs can outrun me any day. Yeah. And that's even at my fastest. You know, so they have, yeah, as, as Vic said, they have to be reminded, you know, yeah. they're, if, if it's seven, eight feet tall and it's only four feet behind you, it doesn't have to do anything but reach out and lean forward and reach out and touch you. Maybe not even lean forward with not those even, arms. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. So, you know, I mean, but I think that's that, that's f that fright talking. Mm -hmm. It's like, uh, you know, it's, it, it's what gave them the energy or the wherewithal to do what they had just done. <laughs> They're looking back on, I'm still winning. I'm still winning. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad my friend with my, the pistol isn't around. Cause I'd have been down already, yeah. but I'm, you know, it's, it's yeah. Like he said, bring them back to the realization that, no, it wasn't. It wasn't four feet behind you because you're such a such an all star. It's yeah. because all it had to do was reach out and just tap you on the shoulder, and you would have probably just pooped yourself. Yeah. You know, if it worse than you already had. Yeah, exactly. Now, Vic, I got to ask you um, because this comes up in the Bigfoot world a lot, but I, I've heard claims of people riding uh, four by fours that clocked a Bigfoot at about forty five miles an hour. And I've got to ask, what is the, have you heard any claims as to the speed of a dogman? Well, about the fastest credible report I've heard about a dogman moving, have the dogman moving about 55 to 60. Yeah, That's about God. as fast as I've, I've heard a credible eyewitness talk about seeing one move. Right. That's amazing. Because they've been known to keep up with cars going 45, 50, close to 60 miles an hour as through the stories I've heard. Yeah. So they're pretty incredible. Even, uh, even Linda Godfrey, uh, mentions that, you know, yeah. that, yeah, that they had stayed up with this car doing 45 down this dirt road and stuff. So, yeah. you know, yeah, incredible. 
It is, and and that guy must have been a hell of a sprinter then. Yeah, hell of a sprinter. <laughs> yeah, Fastest if he was on the move. line with this, he'd still be talking about how fast he was. <laughs> but that reminds yeah. me, there is this one poor woman who was driving down this country road. She lived way out in the sticks, and unfortunately, she was driving down this country road, and it was a night where it was just cool enough where. You wanted to have your window down, but you couldn't get away with having it down all the way. So she had hers down maybe, I guess, eight inches or something like that. Well, she was heading down this country road doing about maybe 45, maybe 50. And she came around this wide sweeping gradual curve, if I remember correctly. And all of a sudden she saw this figure kind of run out onto the road and it paralleled the car and then it just came up against her window Mm -hmm. i guess it was dark enough out where she was having a hard time making out what kind of figure it was but as it came up against the car she could tell that it was kind of like a hominid style body it might have been a canine type dog man on on digitigrade style legs it was Mm -hmm. too dark for it to see that i think but nonetheless she said it had kind of like a a head like a german shepherd in a way but it was just acting totally apoplectic it was just shaking its head and banging its head against her window and slobber. It was leaving slobber on her window and snarling and, and everything, clacking its hands, claws, I guess, on top of the car. And it was just acting like it was out of its mind. And she was just thanking her lucky stars that she had her window up far Mm -hmm. enough where it couldn't reach its head in to get her. But, and I might've butchered some details from that experience. I talked to so many eyewitnesses. Oh, it's just sure. so hard to keep the details straight, but yeah. Can you imagine what that would do to you? If you live out in the country, you're used to making that drive every night <laughs> and in the wee hours yeah. that happens to you. Wow. Yeah. That reset your whole expectation of that road. I'm, I'm betting. Well, you know, and, and it doesn't really <laughs> matter how far her window was rolled up because I'm sure if that dog man wanted to get in that car, even even if it could just get its fingers in there, it'll rip that glass right out. Oh know? yeah. So once again, we have this um, um, ferocious display, but yet we don't have any of the actual damage or you know uh, obvious pointing to trying to get in. Right. So interesting. Huh. Yeah, that is strange. It's kind of like Bear Bear was on, and he talked about how he believes the, the, the Bigfoot count coup. And it sounds like that oh. may be the dogman's version of counting the coup. Wow. Yeah, that's incredible. But terrifying. I mean, God, because that's like just seeing that visage. I mean, yeah. I, I don't know. You've, I don't know how you cope with that. But that brings up another question that was asked in the chat was, Vic, do you, do you help the witnesses – in dealing with their experiences and, and PTSD or, or any such things like that. Do I help the eyewitnesses deal with the PTSD they suffer from their encounters? Is that yeah. the, the yeah. question? Yeah. Do you help them get their lives back together? I guess it's probably the best way to frame that. Well, yeah, that's what I do. Right. A lot of people who know about dog me encounters, they think I happen to be a host and, That's what I do, but the truth of the matter is when someone contacts me wanting help with their encounter and they say that they actually want to come on the show, it's like, oh, really? That's the exception rather than the rule. No, by far and away, most of the eyewitnesses who contact me, they just want help putting Mm -hmm. their lives back together after having an encounter with a dog man or dog men. So, yeah, that's what I do. That's my job. I don't moonlight doing this. I'm not an accountant, a mechanic, like I tell eyewitnesses. I'm not a mechanic. I'm not an accountant. I'm not a physician. No, I help dogmen eyewitnesses put their lives back together after unfortunately having an encounter with one. Mm. That's what I do. No, that's cool. And and I think that that's important uh, because, as you stated before, there wasn't really anywhere for them to go. But now at least when they contact you, you're going to be there to help them put it all back together. You know, it's not just a, hey, come on and tell me what happened. Okay, thanks, bye. You know, you're you're walking through the process with them, and I think that that's that's fantastic. Um, we we have similar resources here on the portal for people dealing with spiritual problems and and you know dark hauntings and and other things. And it's been amazing. It's been wonderful to be able to help people like that. Mm-hmm. And you know, mm-hmm. it was never a matter of course for the show, but it definitely has become. Uh, a, a part of a point of pride, yeah. yeah, a point of pride because 
you know, it, it, at least, you know, we're there for the people as much as we can be as well. So I really commend you on that because that's, that's great. I, I don't know what it would be like to see this happen and to deal with this kind of thing, but I, I, I'm just really thrilled that you're, you're also a resource to help them pick up the pieces because I'm sure the PTSD must be mm. off the charts. You know, seeing something like that coming at you, that's the kind of thing you just don't, you know, forget about. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's no denying that. Imagine talking with a man in his 60s who, on every other aspect of his life, he's got it together. Mm -hmm. I mean, he has a great life carved out for himself, but unfortunately, he had a very traumatic encounter with the dog man. And when he's talking to you about it, that's another thing. Whenever you hear somebody come onto the show and talk about their encounter, no, that's not the first conversation we've had. Mm -hmm. We will have spoken before that interview ever took place. I don't even try to help put the pieces back together on the show interviews. Right, no, right. we do that first. We put the pieces back together first, and then after we've done that, we'll go ahead and schedule an interview when I think they're ready to actually mm -hmm. record a show. But having said all that, yeah, there's nothing like talking with a man like that who's in his 60s or a woman who's in her 60s or maybe 70s even who has every other aspect of their life together. But unfortunately, they had a dogman encounter mm -hmm. and a bad one at that. And yeah. when they're talking to you, it sounds like they're sitting on a paint shaker because they're so yeah. distraught, so shaken, and understandably so. They're not any more shaken than they would have been if they were a kid who heard a strange sound under their bed in the middle of the night and, sure. and looked underneath the bed and came nose to nose with the boogeyman. I mean, mm -hmm. the poor people who experience these encounters – you really have to feel for them. Right. Yeah. They never asked to have this happen. It did. So, yeah, I just feel so blessed, so lucky to be in a position where I can help to try to help them put their lives back on the tracks and, and get back to good. Yeah. Wow. That's cool. And, and you're right. I, you know, in just this clip that I'm going to play now, it's from your episode 117. And, uh, you know, as I was listening to it, what what strikes me the most is the emotion in this man's voice when he's telling his experience. And you can tell, even though you guys have talked about it, and even though by the time you recorded this, he had things in, you know, in much better perspective, but that, that raw emotion is still there. So I'm going to play that now, if that's okay with you, Vic. It sure is. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is a witness report from the Dogman Encounters show. And uh, just sit back and buckle up. This is a... It's an amazing story. This event happened back in 1981. I was 17 years old. It was really hot that night, and it would have been probably the latter part of July or perhaps the first week or two in August. I mean, it was really hot, and, of course, I was driving that night when it occurred, and, and I was driving with my windows down because I didn't have any air conditioning. But anyway, this event happened when my wife and I were first dating. I think maybe we had been dating maybe about a year. I had just gotten my driver's license. Most teenagers get their driver's license when they're 16, but I didn't get mine until I was 17 years old. My dad had just bought me a 1968 Dodge Coronet, and I really loved that car, and I was really proud of it. It was kind of a burnished copper color with metal flake paint. It had nice mags on it, jacked up in the rear end. You know how the folks did with the muscle cars back at that time. It had a 318 engine in it, and of course now there's a lot of bigger and better Mopar engines out there. But this engine had been bored out, and it had been built. It had quite a bit of power, and I had a nice set of cherry bomb mufflers on it. And, uh, man, I just loved the sound that it made as I drove along, as I downshifted or accelerated the roar of that engine coming through those cherry bomb mufflers. And, you know, now that I think back on it, and since we talked the other day, I've been thinking a little bit more about the encounter and trying to make sense of it and why that it occurred. And I got to thinking about it. It's very possible I triggered the encounter that night and really what I consider as an attack by what I was doing with the engine of that car because, you know, as I would go into curves and I'd downshift, 
maybe, you know, sometimes I was kicking it up into neutral and goosing it and, you know, revving the engine. When I'd come out of the curves in the straightaways, I would kind of get into it just a little bit. And, you know, just listening to the roar of that engine coming through those cherry bomb mufflers. And maybe, I don't know, maybe this thing was in the middle of a hunt as I was driving. And I'll tell in the moment where the event occurred. But as I was driving down this road, there was pasture fields on either side of me, bounded by high ridges and woodland. And there was cattle and horses in the fields. And in other places, there was silage corn. I don't know if you know what that is, but primarily in this part of the country. I live in East Tennessee, just a couple of counties to the northwest of Smoky Mountains. And in our part of the country, it's primarily cattle farming, what people out west would call a a small ranch operation. Primarily, they raise beef cattle, some dairy cattle, and they raise silage corn. And Of course, they harvest the ears of corn to feed the cattle and to feed hogs and things like that, horses. And they grind up the corn stalks and the leaves and everything and make what they call silage out of it. And they store it in silos and they use that as feed for their cattle and horses and their hogs and things in the winter. And so I could see these cornfields and it was a bright moonlit night. And I could see occasionally these cornfields. And also at that time, there was a lot of tobacco raised in this part of the country. Of course, uh, there's not so much anymore. But back then, just about everybody had their own patch of tobacco. They would raise tobacco and sell it. And I could see cattle and horses in the field. It was such a bright moonlit night. I could see in the fields almost as good as you could in the day. And I, and also interspersed among the the cattle and horses in the field were deer. And it's very possible that this thing was in the middle of a hunt and about to maybe spring on a deer or maybe even a cow or a calf. And I interrupted its hunt with the sound of this engine as I was driving down through here. But like I said, I live in East Tennessee, maybe about 500 yards south of the Virginia line. And my occurrence happened actually over the line in the state of Virginia. But I was going to see my wife, as I said, and I wanted to show her this car that I had gotten that my dad had bought for me. I wanted to take her for a ride in it. You know, I was real proud of it. I wanted her to see it. And I was going to visit her at her parents' house, which is actually the property that we live on now in our home. But she lived at that time, we were teenagers, and she lived at that time with her parents, and I lived with mine. This was several years before that we got married. But my grandparents, they lived on a road that's called Wagoner Hollow Road, and then this road runs about, it's about 20, 25 miles long, and it begins in southwest Virginia, and it crosses over the line, and it passes through two counties in Tennessee as well, but the occurrence happened on the Virginia side of the line. Like I said, my grandparents live on this Wagoner Hollow Road. I really don't know why they call it a hollow. It's really kind of a narrow valley, and just like most of the area around here, it primarily consists of narrow valleys and hollows and bounded on all sides by high woody ridges. We've got a lot of trees here. I mean, you could start from where I live a squirrel could and can just about almost without any breaks except for, you know, where the roads do pass through, travel from my house through the state of Virginia all the way to Cumberland Gap into Kentucky and almost never have to touch the ground. I mean, there's just woods everywhere on all the ridges all around. And this is how this valley was, this wagon or hollow road. This is how it was. The road was real curvy narrow country road and it just kind of meanders through the valley all the way on the Virginia side and on the Tennessee side with farmland on either side and of course three strand barbed wire fences all along the way and fields. The valley here it goes anywhere from three or four hundred yards on either side of the road and in some places narrows down maybe to 150 yards or 100 yards or something like that but you know it varies from different places. But anyway, I was going to take the route through this Wagoner Valley Road to go and see my wife. And my grandparents lived in this Wagoner Hollow Road. 
And my mother asked me if I would drop her off at my grandparents' house to visit with them while I went to see my wife and then, you know, come back and pick me up afterwards. And so I agreed to do that. So I took my mother to my grandparents' house and I dropped her off and I went on up to where my wife and I live now to her parents' house and I took her for a ride in the car, showed her the car and I ate supper with them and we stayed there and, and visited together till about maybe about eleven, uh eleven fifteen, something like that. And then I left and I turned off the road that she lived on where we now live onto this Wagner Holler Road and went back to pick my mother up at my grandparents' house. And now, as I said, this road, it's got a lot of sharp curves in it. There's some straightaways, but for the most part, it's just a windy, twisty, narrow country road. You can't go too fast. And of course, I just got my license. I was an inexperienced driver. My car, I hadn't had it too long and I wasn't used to it. And so, of course, if you know anything about those muscle cars, they do great in the straightaway and you can just fly with them, but they don't take curves too good. And so I couldn't go real fast. And I probably wasn't driving over 30 miles an hour at the maximum. And in a lot of cases, I was slowing down maybe to about 20 miles an hour. But in any event, I was going down through there, and I was downshifting and, and revving the engine and listening to the sound of the engine coming through those cherry bomb mufflers, and I was watching and looking at the cattle and the horses and the fields and everything, you know, on either side as I was going down through there. And I was just getting ready to go into a long and sharp curve that curved around to the right hand. And I noticed on the right-hand side of the road, and as I was going down through here, like I said, the moon was lighting everything up, and I could see everything almost as good as I could during the daytime in the fields. But the ridges and the woods on either side, they just kind of appeared like clumps, shadowy clumps. I couldn't really see much detail from them. And as I began to go into this long curve to the right, there was a shadow that kind of detached from maybe about 100, 150 yards off on my right, kind of detached from the shadows of the tree line and started moving at an angle away from the tree line, almost parallel in my vehicle, but coming at an angle. And I could tell by the way that the road was curving around to the right and the angle that this thing was moving, that it was going to intersect my vehicle. And I mean, this thing was moving on now. What I'm about to tell you about, Vic, this all happened and it couldn't be more than just a few seconds maybe 20, 30 seconds, something like that, certainly less than a minute, and couldn't have been any longer than that. But it just seemed like time just slowed down to a crawl, and it just seemed like everything was moving in slow motion. I don't know what it was about it, but there was something about this figure that just unnerved me, and it just made me uneasy. This, Whatever it was, this thing just, it just didn't look, I couldn't really tell what it was about it, but there was something about it that just looked unnatural to me. Of course, I found out later on why that was as it got closer to me, and I could tell what it was. And this thing was actually taking a longer path of travel than I was the way that it was running, but I could tell, I mean, this thing was going to come in direct contact with me somewhere around this curve, and, I mean, it was moving fast, I mean, super fast. I couldn't really tell what it was, but, uh, I mean, it was one of the fastest moving things that I'd ever seen. Anyway, as I'm coming around this curve, this thing is just keeping my attention, and my eyes are darting back and forth from the right. I got, you know, I have to look at the road or I'm going to run out of the road because I'm going around the curve, but it, it's drawing my attention. I keep looking at it and trying to figure out what this thing is and what it is that's so strange about the way that it looks. And it begins to draw a little bit closer to me. And, you know, I kind of thought maybe when it first came out, maybe it might be a deer. There's a whole lot of white-tailed deer in this area that we live in. And pretty much on a daily basis when I'm going to work, I'll see one somewhere along the way that's been hit by a car and killed. And, you know, I didn't want this thing to run out in front of me and hit my car. And for one thing, at that time, in Tennessee, there was no law requiring you to have automobile insurance, and my dad, he didn't believe in having it. 
And so I didn't have any insurance on my car, and I didn't want this thing, whatever it was, to cause me to wreck or to hit my car and do damage to it because I didn't have the money to fix it or to replace it. But then as I was watching this thing, I noticed that there was something strange about it. I noticed that whatever it was, it wasn't running on all fours. Whatever this thing was, it was on two feet. I didn't understand what it was. It just seemed to me like, I mean, the only thing that I know of in this area, and we do have black bears, they're rare, but we do have some in this area, but a black bear just cannot move at the speed that this thing was moving at. I mean, a black bear, when it gets up on its hind legs, it's just not natural for it, and it just moves in a clumsy fashion, and this thing, whatever it was, I mean, it was just moving super fast, and it was just fluid in its motions in the way that it ran, and no bear could get up on its hind feet and run in the way that this thing was running. But yet, you know, it couldn't be a man. I knew that it could not be a man because I I, I ran track when I was in high school. I ran the 880 relay, ran the 440, and I knew that a human being could not run as fast as this thing was running. And I just couldn't understand what this thing was that was angling across this field and coming toward me, and I knew that was going to intersect me as it came across this field. And as I'm going along, it starts to get a little bit closer as it's running at an angle, but yet at the same time kind of parallel in my car. And it's keeping up with my car. It's keeping up with the speed that I'm going at. And I don't understand this. I don't understand how this thing can be going and keeping the same speed as my car. You know, I'm coming into this sharp curve, and I've got to slow down. And I know that this thing pretty soon is going to come out, maybe jump out in front of me and meet me and meet the line of travel of my car. And as it drew closer, I began to see more details about this thing. And it, for definite sure, was running on its hind legs. It wasn't on all fours. It was on its hind legs like a man, but it wasn't like a man. I mean, this thing was on its hind legs, but it wasn't standing up fully erect like a human being does. This thing was, it kind of appeared stooped as it was running. It was standing up. It was on its hind legs, but yet it wasn't standing up straight. And this didn't look like a human figure. It looked like something totally different. It, It looked like something that, I mean, I'd never seen anything that looked like this thing. And as it begins to draw closer, I began to pick out more detail about it. And I can tell that whatever this thing is, it don't have knees like a human being does. This thing has hocks like a horse or a cow or a deer or something like that. But a four-legged animal like that cannot run on its hind legs like that. I mean, cannot possibly move as fast and as, as fluidly and as, as swiftly as this thing was moving. And then I noticed, I could see in the moonlight that it looked like it had a big dog's head. I mean, that, that that's all I know how to explain it. I mean, it had a long snout on it, like a wolf or maybe like a German shepherd. And it looked like it had long, tall ears that were standing straight up on the top of its head. And I could see that it had a long, bushy tail. And the only thing I know that I can think of that it reminded me of was a coyote's tail. But at that time, I don't think that we've got them here now. They came in here now, but I don't think we even had coyotes in this part of the country at that time. I'd never heard about it anyway. And there's no way that a coyote would be that big, and there's no way that it could run on its hind legs like this thing was running. And that tail, it streamed out behind it, that long, bushy tail. And it was kind of bouncing up and down a little bit as it was running. And... I noticed that this thing had arms and that the arms, they were, you know, they were kind of pumping like a human being's. But, you know, when a human runs, a human being pumps his arms almost as fast as his legs are moving. And this thing was kind of pumping them, but they weren't moving as fast as his legs were moving. And another thing that I noticed the majority of the time when a human being runs, a human kind of clenches their fist when they run. And this thing wasn't doing that. It was almost holding its hands, and that's what they looked like. It didn't look like paws to me. I can only describe them 
as hands. It more or less looked like they were hanging almost limp as it ran, and I could see the fingers hanging down as this thing ran. And as it began to draw closer, I could see that it had hair or fur all over its body. I could see that, and I could tell that. I couldn't really tell for sure, but it looked to me like it was black, but later on, I realized that that's what color it was, but I really couldn't tell the color yet at this point. And so this thing begins to draw closer. And as I said, it was a really hot night, and I was driving along in my car, and I had my windows rolled down because I didn't have any air conditioning on it. And, you know, this thing keeps drawing closer and closer to me. And and I just, you know, my unease just grows more and more. And I'm starting to get scared. I, I don't I don't understand it. I don't know what this thing is. I just can't make out what this thing is. It, it don't look like anything that I've ever seen before. And it begins to draw closer. It gets close to the barbed wire fence on the right-hand side. And I think, well, maybe it's going to slow down or, or maybe it'll veer off where it won't run into that barbed wire and it'll turn aside out of my way. But it didn't do that. Instead of doing that, this thing sped up. And instead of turning aside, it jumped right over the fence. And it landed on my side of the fence in between the ditch line and the fence, and then it took another bound. And the next thing I know, this thing is out in the road. I mean, it's right next to my vehicle, and it scared me so bad that I, I jerked the wheel, and, and, and I ran over in, in, into the left lane, and, and I was driving in the left-hand lane. And, and, and if there had been, uh, been a car coming, I mean, you know, I, I, it would have hit me head on, but it scared me so bad when this thing jumped across the fence, and I thought it was going to jump right into my vehicle that I, I you know, just not thinking inst- instinctually, I just jerked the wheel to the left and went over as far as I dared into the left-hand lane. And this thing, it started running right along beside of me. And I want to tell you, Vic, like I said, I had the windows rolled down, but I had carry bomb mufflers on that car, and if you know what they're like, they're loud. But yet, at the same time, I could hear the nails of this thing, the toenails, click, 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 clacking on the road as it ran along beside me. And I could, man, I could see it good now. And, you know, I, 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 I had to, I, I really didn't want to look at its face. I really didn't want to see its face. But I couldn't help it. it. It's just like I couldn't help myself. I had to. And, I mean, this thing was tall. I, it had to be at least seven feet tall. It towered over the top of my car. And it was running along beside me. It couldn't have been more than five or six feet off the passenger side of my car. Just, I mean, right even with my passenger side window. I could see it just as clear as day as it ran along beside of me. And I, I really didn't want to see its face. But I felt like I, I just couldn't help it. I had to. And so, and, and it was so tall, I had to kind of lean over, almost lay over uh, uh, on the right side, kind of in the seat, and pop myself up with my hand on the right side while I hung on to the wheel and drove with the left to, to get a look at it and, and, and to see its face. And I, I wish that I hadn't, but I did. You know, this thing definitely, I mean, it was, it had to be, like I said, it had to be seven feet tall, Vic. Oh God, this thing, it looked like a gigantic wolf or, 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 or maybe, uh, maybe something like a, 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 a German shepherd or something like that. But it, it, its ears were different. They were slim and they were high and pointed, like I said, on top and had kind of like tusks sticking out. And you know, I've heard a lot of people describe these things and I've, I've heard them say that, that, you know, they couldn't tell what they were. But I'm here to tell you, this thing was a male. There was no doubt about that. I mean, it was right there in the open, in the clear, just as plain as day, right in front of me. And I'm not going to use any kind of vulgarity or anything like that, but let me just put it this way. As I leaned over and looked out the vehicle, I mean, I could tell just exactly what it was because it was right there at the base of his belly, right in front of me, and I could tell just as plain as day that it was a male. This thing is running along beside of me, and... You know, at first, it it it, it just uh, it it's like it's not even seeing me. It's like it's not even paying attention to me in my car. Like it, it don't even notice us. 
or like it, it just don't even care uh, uh, about me being there in that car as it's as it's running along, and 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 you know my eyes are darting back and forth like I said from the road to this thing as I'm I'm trying to drive around this curve and, and man I wanted to hit the gas and I wanted I wanted to just floor it and I wanted to get out of there, but I didn't dare do it because I was afraid I would run out of the road and run into the ditch and 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 I would wreck and there I'd be with this thing and. I mean, I'd just be right there at its mercy. But yet I wanted to because I, I could tell. I mean, this thing had, had arms. If it, if, if it hadn't had them, if it had, didn't have them bent and wasn't pumping them as it ran, this thing's arms would have hung down below its hocks, Vic. And, and, and I know that if it wanted to, this thing could have reached right in my car window and right over to the driver's side from the passenger side, and this thing could have grabbed me and it could have drugged me right out of the car. If it wanted to, it could have just ripped my head off. Or it could have it could have leaned in in my car window and it could have bit my head off. I don't know. I know it could have and I wanted to get out of there, but I didn't dare because I was in this steep curve and I knew that if I hit the gas, this car probably wasn't going to be able to handle the curve and it was going to run off in the ditch and I was going to wreck and I was going to be there alone with this thing and I was going to be at its mercy. And oh, and like I said, I, I mean, I got a, I got a good look at it. I got a, a real good look at, at, at what this thing looked looked like, and and it was just as jet black black as it could be. It had it had hair uh, or fur over most of its body, maybe about three or four inches long, thick fur, and it was glossy. It, it had a sheen on it. It was reflecting the light from that full moon. And, uh, I mean, it was just thick all over its body, except for uh, it kind of thinned out uh, down on its belly, uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, up above its uh, up above its legs. But other than that, it was just, just thick, thick hair, maybe about uh, three, three, four inches long. And, and, and uh, up around its head, the back of its head, and kind of like down over, I don't know what to call it other than shoulders, down over its shoulders, it was maybe about five, six inches long. It was just a little bit longer. I've heard people describe it kind of as a, like a, the mane of a lion, but uh, it wasn't that long. It wasn't that much difference in the length of the of the hair, but you could tell that it was just a little bit longer. And this thing, it, like I said, it had a, had a long snout on it, like a like a German Shepherd or like a wolf. And I could see as as it was running along beside me, I could see its its mouth was kind of relaxed and open, and I could see that it had like, you know, jagged shaped teeth like a, like a dog's got on the side of its mouth. But it had fangs that were about maybe four inches long that were hanging down over its bottom lip. And the bottom ones were disappearing up into the top lip. But its mouth was kind of parted, and, and it, it kind of had its tongue hanging out on the left side of its mouth, just like a dog does as it runs along, as, it, as, as it's painting. And uh, like I said, this thing wasn't paying a bit more attention to me than if I wasn't even there. And for a little while, it just ran along beside me and just didn't pay me any attention. But that didn't last. Just slowly, seemed like just seemed like it took forever. But just slowly, it started to turn its head, and it and it looked at me. And you know, I I I I, I know that you said that. You shouldn't, and I've heard other people say that you shouldn't, but I couldn't help it. I looked full in its eyes. I wish that I hadn't. I wish I'd never seen it. I wish I could erase the picture of what I saw from my mind, but I can't. And, you know, I've heard people say that they had amber or yellow eyes or, or red or orange-like eyes, but that's not what I saw that night. This thing had great big black eyes. And I couldn't see any kind of pupil. I couldn't see any kind of white or anything like that. But uh, all I could see was black. And then and, and they just looked as black to me as a bottomless pit. They, they just seemed soulless to me. And and, and I, I tell you, Vic, I just I just had a sense of uh, of evil that came over me. And and this thing, when it looked at me, it was like it was like that it could look through me. And looked to my very soul, and, and and like I said, I just felt like I had been touched by evil. I don't know how else to explain it. And there was such a fear, and and I I, I wanted to, to 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 scream or to holler, holler out or do something, 
but it just seemed like my mouth just dried up like cotton, and there wasn't a sound that would come out. And I wanted to get out of there. I wanted to get away from this thing, but I couldn't because I was afraid I was going to wreck. And then it, it, it came closer to my vehicle, Vic, and it leaned down. It leaned in. And, and, and mind you, this thing is running beside my car the whole time. And it, it leaned over, Vic, and it stuck its head in my window, and and it grabbed hold of my door with its right hand, and and, and that, I don't know how to describe it as other than that. It, it, it was a hand, and, and, and I know that people had described this thing as they had to, to, to say that they 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 kind of look like raccoon hands, and and maybe in a way that's right or. Uh, or maybe a, a, a mix between the, the hand of a raccoon and, uh, and maybe the hand of a monkey, something like that. But this thing had huge hands, and it had had long, long black nails, maybe about three inches long, two or three inches long, on the ends of its of its nails, long black thick nails. And this thing put its right hand on my door, and I and I could hear it. it it put its left hand on on my doorknob, and it was jerking at my door, and it was jiggling my door handle. But thank goodness, when I had been at my wife's house, at my, then my girlfriend, and I'd been at her parents' house, I'd locked the car. And when I came back out, I didn't unlock that door because nobody was going to be riding with me at that point uh, before I went to get my went back to get my mother. And uh, uh, so it wasn't able to get my door open. But this thing was leaning in my window, and it was looking right at me. And it, it, it I mean, it, it seemed like that it, it, it curled its, it, it, it curled its lips back. And, and, and I, I know it smiled at me, but I, I don't really remember hearing it. All I could hear was the sound of my engine and the sound of its toenails as it ran along beside my vehicle going clack, 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 clack on, on the pavement. And, this, I mean, I could. It, it breathed on me, and it was hot breath, and it, and it, it was, it was. Uh, you know how people describe that breath as being kind of faded, and seemed like I could smell blood, and 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 maybe decaying flesh as it breathed on me. It was horrible, and oh, I thought I was dead. I thought this was the end of me. I thought I was a goner. I thought I was a dead man for sure. At just about that time. The curve ended, and, and and I came into a straightaway, and I just hit the gas and and pushed it to the floor, and I took out of there. I took my eyes off of it, and I looked ahead, and out of the corner of my eye, I saw its its nails. Just I saw it lose a grip on my car door, and I saw its nails r- uh, uh, rake across the top of my door, and its head disappeared from my window. And I don't know. I had to be going seventy or eighty miles an hour. I don't know for a time there. I mean, I, I, I just, I just had to peel out of there and get away from this thing. And as I drove away from it, as I pulled away from it, I looked in my rear view mirror and I could see it getting smaller and smaller as it began to slow down. And the last thing I remember, the last thing that I saw, this thing veered off to the right again and jumped over the fence and disappeared into that field. And I'm telling you, Vic, I, I, I was so, I've never been so scared in all of my life. I mean, it was just absolutely horrifying. And I, and I went on and, and drove on it. And this, this happened maybe about two miles from my house where I live now. And, 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 and maybe it wasn't, it couldn't have been over a mile, mile and a half from my grandparents' house. And I went on there and I picked my mom up, but I never told her a thing about what happened. And I never told my wife, who was my girlfriend at the time. Like I said, I never told her, and I've never told her in the 35 years since this has happened. I never told any of my friends. I didn't tell my dad. I've never told any of my children. I've never told anybody until I filed the report with you the other day. And you called me. I've never talked to anybody about this and told them about what happened. I tell you, it was the most horrifying experience of my life. And my dad, he asked me the next day where the scratches came from on my vehicle. And I told him that I, I run out of the road and I run into a thorn bush, and that's where the scratches came from. And I tell you, Vic, I love that car. I mean, it, I loved it. But I could not keep that car thinking about what happened and, and what I went through that night. I just couldn't keep it. I had to get rid of it. And I traded that car for a 74 Nova. 
and, and I got rid of it. And, and you know, I, I, as time went on, I, I mean, I couldn't sleep. I didn't sleep for that, for nights after this. Uh, if I would drift off to sleep, I'd wake up having nightmares, seeing this thing happen over and over again. And I couldn't keep it out of my mind when I'd lay in my bed. And I'd think about it and, and, and just go over and over and over what happened in my mind. And, and you know, that night, I, I, I didn't know what I'd seen. I really didn't understand what it was. You know, I'd read about and, and heard about werewolves and things like that, but I really didn't connect this thing with that. And you asked me, uh, you mentioned, maybe in the pre-interview, you mentioned about horror movies. And I can tell you right now, I don't watch horror movies. I hear people talk about saying it looked like uh, this werewolf in this movie or that movie, but I've never seen them. The only werewolf movies that I ever saw were the old Lon Chaney movies when I was a kid. That's that's the only ones I've ever watched. Anything that come out after 1981, I can tell you right now, I've not seen it because I won't watch them. My wife, when my kids were little, my sisters would come up and they loved horror movies and my wife loves horror movies and so did my children. And my wife, you know, they'd go and, and back then we had VCRs and we rented movies and they'd go out and they'd rent horror movies and I'd go to bed or I'd go off in another room. I, I could not watch them and I can't watch them to this day. I told you this caused uh, just extreme bad behavior in me. I mean, I, I engaged in things. I'm not going into details what they were. I hate that I did them, but I did things that I know now was trying to deal with this. But, you know, I put it out of my mind, and I suppressed it for all those years. But yet there was something that bothered me. And, you know, I live, my house is only about 40 or 50 yards from the woods. I've got woods in behind my house. I've got woods on the right side of my house. I've got woods on the left side of my house. And I've always had an anxiety about living so close to the woods. And I know now that that's why that is. And when I go out in my backyard, I just can't stay out there because I feel like that there's something out there, that there's something lurking in the woods that's looking at me and that's watching me. And I just can't stand it, and I have to go back in the house. And You know, I used to want to hunt, but in 35 years after this thing has happened to me, since I saw this thing that I now know, I couldn't explain it then. I thought maybe it might be a demon. I thought maybe I was having a waking nightmare, or maybe it was just my imagination. I just didn't have any explanation for it. And I now know that that thing was a dog man. I didn't know about them then, and I didn't understand. But now I know what that that's what that thing was. And I tell you, Vic, like I said, I, I used to want to hunt, but I can't do it. In the past 35 years, I have not hunted one time. I own guns. I love guns. But the only thing that I do is target shoot with them. I don't take them into the woods because I just can't do it. I mean, I've I tried to go a couple of times, but I just couldn't stand it. I just had to leave because there's something out there, and I know it's out there. And, you know, like I said, I put this thing out of my mind, and I, and I really wasn't thinking about what it was. I know what it is now because when I heard the description of a dog man on Dog Man Encounters, this all came flooding back to me, and I know what it is now. And I tell you, Vic, I know that these things are real. I know that night it wasn't a demon, it wasn't my imagination, it wasn't some kind of waking dream. I know that I saw a real, living, breathing animal. And I tell you, I, I believe these things are dangerous. I mean, I hear about these people that, that want to have an encounter and go out and hunt for them or hunt for Bigfoot. You know, there was a time I thought maybe I might like to do something like that. But I tell you right now, I think they're crazy. These things are nothing to fool with, and I don't think anybody ought to go out there looking to meet up with one of these things. You may meet up with it for real, and you may wish, like I wish, that you had never seen the thing. And I tell you, I've, I've heard you say that you shouldn't ever look these things in the eye, but I did that night. I, I looked this thing full into the eye, and it felt like it was looking into my very soul. I felt like it knew everything about me, and when it looked at me that night, as something else that I forgot to mention a, a while ago, when it stuck its head in my w open window and looked at me and curled its lips back. I mean, like I said, it was like it was giving me a, a, a seditious grin, and it licked its chops. You know, you've seen, you've seen a wolf or a dog do that. It licked its chops at me, Vic, like it was telling me, I know that you're lunch, 
There's not a thing that you can do to stop me if I want to hurt you, and you look awful delicious to me. That, I mean, that's that's how I feel. I, that's what it looked like to me that it was conveying to me that night. And I tell you, I was scared to death. I was horrified. I've never, ever, ever experienced anything in my life that scared me so bad as that did that night. Oh, it was awful. And and basically, that's what happened to me, Vic. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I, I know I I hadn't heard that, that episode before tonight. Mm -hmm. Um and just hearing yeah. how his voice trembled, how he was still dealing with the emotion of that event that happened so long ago, but it's so incredibly imprinted on his on his very being. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, oh man, Vic, that's that's a powerful, powerful uh, testimonial. Yeah, it's pretty intense, no doubt. Wow, I mean, you know, thank God for what you do. Thank God that you could help him to work past that. But the interesting thing is, is that it sounds like he he had put it so far, buried it mm -hmm. so far in his own psyche, he didn't even realize the impact uh, that it was having in every part of his life after that, and right. and. I suppose him getting to getting the, in touch with you, him sharing this story, will be very cathartic for him, and and has been very cathartic. But it, you could hear it in how he was telling us, like you know, now I know why. Yeah. Now I know why. It was like he was probably doing battle with himself for all these years, carrying around this trauma that there was nowhere to put it. He was, yeah. That's pretty typical for eyewitnesses. <sighs> Some eyewitnesses, they think that you can bury it, and that's the effective way of dealing with it. But I think in most cases, if they do bury it like that, to try and hide it from themselves, which you can't do that. Mm -hmm. But if you do to decide to suppress it like that, it's going to come to the surface, mm -hmm. whether you want it to come to the surface or not, at some point down the road. So, yeah, it's definitely better to... To come to terms with it, meet it head on. The problem is with most of these people, until they find out about me and what I do, they don't have the means to do that. So all they can do is to try and suppress it. And that's the best way they know mm -hmm. to deal with it. So, yeah, yeah, I just, like I said, I feel so lucky to be in a position where people like that can find me and we can talk about what's been troubling them about their encounters and. And bring them back to a good place. I just I feel so lucky. Yeah. Well, I think I think it, you know what you're doing is powerful and it's important, and and of course it's entertaining as well. But that's being on the outside looking in. I I don't think that any of your any of your witnesses would ever uh, use the word entertaining. Yeah. But that's just you know <laughs> that's just me uh, looking at it from the perspective and safety of my home. If I were in those experiences, I, I, you know, I may have a whole different opinion, yeah. um, but you know, it's just, it's a process and the fact that you guys are working through those things and helping them put it back together and, and, and not only that, but giving them a forum and then people like him will hear that story and, and it'll maybe help someone else come forward and help someone else come forward. And, and, uh, you know, that was one of the questions that I had yet to ask you, uh, is why, why in the last 10 years are there so many more stories? Mm -hmm. And do you think it's just a matter of people finally being able to have the dialogue? Well, it's easy to think that more encounters are being reported Yes. Lately, because of the fact that, yeah, you hear about so many more encounters now than you ever heard about in the 90s or even the 2000s. But, yeah, I think it's our communication, the increased ability to communicate that we have now. I think that's the biggest reason why you hear about so many more encounters now than you ever used to hear about. So, yeah, I don't think that they're happening with an increased frequency. I just think it's our ability to let others know. It doesn't matter if you're in Africa, if you're in Antarctica, mm -hmm. if something of note happens, no matter where you're at in the world, on the planet, we have the means now to let that news travel around the world in the snap of a finger. So yeah, I think that's why we hear more about encounters now than we ever have. I don't think it's because they're 
they're breeding like rabbits or anything like that. <laughs> Thank God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no oh, doubt. Yeah. So with that idea, what do you think is keeping their population down? Is it because they prefer to be loners um, or is it just because they don't propagate like you would think um, a, 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 some kind of a wild animal like a wolf or a coyote could? Or do you think it's just something DNA with them? I really don't know. All I could do is guess at that, but it would make sense that they wouldn't become overly fecund like rabbits or roaches because they do have to eat. And if you had dogmen hanging out at the local corner store and <laughs> dogmen over here, over there, yeah. I mean, well, how are they going to feed themselves? How are they going to make a living? So it just makes sense that they would be smart enough to know that if they overpopulate, then that's not going to be in their best interests. It's going to make them easier to discover. And mm. they seem to like being the ones to push the issue, but they don't seem to like when you come looking for them. But, yeah, I think there are a lot of reasons why that might be. I don't know for sure what the real answer is, but there are a lot of possibilities that would explain that. Right. Yeah. You know, um, real quick, I we, I have to ask this question. It's for a friend of ours over in Australia, our buddy Cade. He's been dying for me to ask this question. He wants to know if um, it, how the encounters in Australia differ or uh, differ or are different than the ones in 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 America. What are the differences between those? Are there any differences? No, there don't seem to be any differences, no matter where the encounters happen. They seem to be pretty typical of each other. I mean, whether they happen in Croatia or Africa or Serbia, you name it, they all seem to follow the same predictable course. The dog man, it could have easily evaded detection, but it didn't. It decided to push the issue. It sought out the eyewitness, and once the eyewitness saw it and freaked out, and understandably so, once they freaked out and the dog man saw that, the dog man moved on. Hmm. Rinse, gotta, and repeat. Yeah, Rinse and repeat. Yeah, I've got a I've got a quick question to ask you. I know this is maybe this is too big of a can of worms to get into at this point in the show because I know we're on the tail end here, but. Do you think there is government knowledge of this? And do you think mm -hmm. do they do you think they ever dispatch kill teams to deal with these like are witnessed or are claimed to happen in the Bigfoot world? Thank you for asking that yes. question. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes and yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I definitely I'm convinced that the government knows about them. I've got no doubts the government knows more about them than any other agency anyone would know about them just because they have the means to sure. and yeah i think under certain extreme circumstances they will and have dispatched kill teams i don't know how effective the kill teams have been mm -hmm. and or yeah. are but no i think they do dispatch kill teams if you have a situation that might cause an unfortunate outcome that the government would not be happy with and and then they do send out teams to try and deal with them. Yeah. Like in the LBL, it's been alleged that that's what happened there. Mm. So, yeah, I think that's a definite yes on both counts. Wow. wow. You know, but now that brings me back to another kind of a conspiratorial question. Because earlier you mentioned that um, maybe not all dogmen are natural. Maybe they are manipulated on a, on a DNA, a cellular level. What are your thoughts on that? Well, some people try to explain away the dogma phenomenon by saying, well, they were just created by our government in some lab. Well, yeah, that I can appreciate you feeling that way, but that definitely wouldn't explain why we had an encounter, several encounters documented back in the 1800s. Right. You're going to tell me that the governments of the world, <laughs> they were advanced enough to be able to gene splice together a dogman back then? No, no way. So, yeah, that does not explain that, but who's to say that now with our technology, maybe we can... Maybe we are advanced enough in our gene splicing to create a test tube dog man. Mm -hmm. But if that's the case, then you have the naturally occurring ones, and then you have the test tube dog man. But yeah, to say that they're all the result of some laboratory experiment, that just doesn't hold water. Right. Wow. 
Well, I know we've kept you a long time. I, I got to thank you so much for oh, coming on the show. Awesome. It's been an epic, epic journey uh, through the portal with you. And uh, thank you so much for making this happen and coming on, on tonight. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Now, I, I, I want you to take a couple minutes and let people know how to stay in touch with you, Vic, and to follow your work. Well, if you'd like to tune in to Dogman Encounters, the best way to do that would be to go to the website, dogmanencounters.com. And once you're there in the site, if you wanted to find out the two different ways to listen, if you visit the podcast page, you'll find all the links you'd need right there, any instructions, all that is right there on the podcast page. If you happen to have had a Dogman Encounter that you need help dealing with, then if you visit dogmanencounters.com, right there on the home page, there is a button you can click on to submit a form that's going to come to me. And I'll receive that form submission, and basically I'll contact you, I'll schedule a conversation with you, and that'll give me a chance to find out what what's troubling you and whatnot, and that way we can work through what's ailing you. Now, on the Sasquatch side of things, if you'd like to listen to Bigfoot Eyewitness Radio, if you go to BigfootEyewitness.com and then visit the podcast page over there, then you'll find all the links and instructions you're going to need on how to listen to that show as well. I also host Bigfoot Eyewitness but, yeah, having said that, that's really all there is to, wow. if you have a dogman encounter you need help with, that's how to contact me. If you want to listen to either one of the two shows I host, Dogman Encounters or Bigfoot Eyewitness Radio, then that's how you would do that. Wow. But having said that, yeah, guys, thanks again so much for having me on. It's been a great oh, time. It's, oh, it's it, been riveting. Yeah, it's been our pleasure, brother. Riveting. Thank you so much. And and uh, hopefully you'll come back on again and we can we can do more investigating of this incredible phenomena. That was incredible. Just say the word. All right, brother. Well, thank you again. And ladies and gentlemen, thank all of you for tuning in. I, I know we've got to have some new faces. Uh, there's a lot of people watching the live stream. Thank you guys so much. If you like what you saw, please get subscribed and hit the bell so you can know when we're coming on live again. Uh, we uh, really appreciate all of you being here and taking part in this journey. And, uh, you know, we we'll, we got a lot more shows to come. So right. hopefully, you'll, hopefully you'll stick around. And, yep. Don, anything in closing? Uh, you know, our Teespring. Uh, we have that special uh, promo for for um, uh, Halloween. Halloween. Uh, Spooky 20 will get you 20% off your order. I want to say thank you, Vic. It's been a riveting two hours, and it's gone so quickly as well. <laughs> it was awesome to speak with you. Thank you very much. And oh, you're welcome. It's been a great time talking with you. Excellent. All right, guys. Well, that's going to wrap it up for us. Thank you all very much. We love you all. Be good. Be kind. Be nice. Take care of each other. Help each other out. Find the magic in every day. And remember to laugh as much as you can. Good night, everybody. Good night.